Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism Live! Shut up and sit down. Good evening. Well, the gang's all here, right at the outset. Look at that. I miss the applause, by the way. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I look forward to the applause every week. And that was real applause. So this is going to be a ton of fun. We've got uh, Brian Buchanan and Lindsay Hansen Park on the show with RFM and myself. Last week, I'll just remind callers, we'll jump into this pretty quick, uh, and I'll check with you guys to see if you have anything before we start. But uh, last week, uh, one of the callers uh, intimated that they weren't bothered by the data as much because uh, they didn't believe that Joseph Smith was a polygamist. And I took that as a challenge. So I decided uh, one week from just now, or basically a couple hours, uh, less than a week or more than a week, but I decided that we would go ahead and uh, take on the challenge of trying to show that Joseph Smith was a polygamist. And I have spent significant amount of time in the last week, uh, probably somewhere in the range of about 50 to 55 hours or so, putting all of this together. Deep thanks to, to all of you. Each of you added in uh, a lot of things that will come up in tonight's conversation. Brian, I just want to give you a special thanks for some documents that I did not have access to. Um, I got a bunch of them, but I was missing three or four, and you helped me get those last few, so I appreciate that very much. Uh, anything from you guys before we start? Any other notes or things you guys want to say before we kick it off? I just want to say thanks for having me. This is a topic that matters a lot to me. Uh, this is a growing conspiracy theory. And uh, I, and I call it that because it is one, um, not because I you know want to diminish people that, that latch onto this, but because it is a product of a centuries worth of polygamy denying that was meant to protect the reputation of Joseph Smith and thereby, you know, throwing the reputations of many women um, under the bus. And so it's something that I think that needs to be corrected. And when we talk about history, history is complex and messy and complicated, and it's very compelling and easy to latch on to stories that that make things simpler. And this, of course, is a messy story. Yeah. There have been a number of listeners who've made the comment, why are we going over something that is already so well established? Why are we dealing with something they already know is true? And the answer is, like Lindsay said, it's getting so you can't swing a dead cat in Utah without hitting somebody who denies that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. Yeah, it comes up quite a bit in circles that I'm having conversations in. It seems to be a part of the Denver snuffer movement. I don't know that it's an official tenet. I know there's a lot of his followers who believe this. There's um, other podcasts that are going on and people are really, really um, promoting this idea. So much so that we had Matt call last week. I think it was Matt who calls last week and says, you know, Joseph Smith didn't practice polygamy. And we just roll the eyes and say, okay, hopefully with the research that Bill has done, and he's done a whole lot with your help, and the organization, what we want to do tonight is put together the case that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. And to do that, we're going to rely primarily on contemporaneous documents. Yeah. And, and I want to note two things. There are, you know, the folks who are in the audience probably are mostly made up of folks who already accept that Joseph Smith originated and perpetuated polygamy. Um, I, I think you'll enjoy the show tonight. We're going to see a ton of historical documents. And I learned a ton myself just preparing for this over the last week, it gave me a lot better context for how things happened at the end of Joseph's life with the Nauvoo Expositor and the Nauvoo High Council and the City Council Minutes. Um, it, it gave me a really good feel for some of the other situations with polygamy that I wasn't as informed on. But I am speaking tonight to two groups. And the first group are those who uh, believe that Joseph Smith was not a polygamist. And I'm going to ask you tonight, to sit and listen to all the evidence and, and try to set aside your preconceived notion of what you want it to be. Because I realize that the reason we take the stance 
that Joseph didn't practice polygamy is because we need Joseph Smith to be a prophet and we're uncomfortable with the details of polygamy. And, and because of that, there's going to be some bias, um, some, some confirmation bias and belief persistent stuff that goes on. I'm hoping you'll sit with the evidence tonight as we present it. And I really do think it's convincing. Uh, and then the second group are those folks who are out there who get some notoriety by pushing this idea that Joseph wasn't a polygamist. And I'm simply going to say that when we get done with tonight's episode, I'm happy if someone wants to reach out to us and wants to facilitate a future conversation where we say, hey, saw everything you guys did, still think so, still think it's the more rational answer to say Joseph wasn't part of this. And I'd be happy if you want to email me and we'll put an episode together where we take that story on. But this the 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 evidence that we present tonight, I th I think is overwhelming. And I'm hoping that folks will... Uh, if you're on the other side, that you'll also seriously consider if this is the narrative you push, because it is tough sometimes to then go like, oh, my view might be incorrect. And how do I change my mind? And how do I change my approach? I'm hoping that tonight does that. So uh, anything else from you guys? No, can I say one more thing Please. about framing? One thing I want everybody in our community, in the Mormon community, writ large, ex-Mormon community, wherever, to start doing in their own brains is to decouple polygamy from sex. Uh, we almost think that it's interchangeable as if polygamy means sex. And of course, sex is part of marriage. It's part of Mormon marriage. But we need to be looking at polygamy in relation to power. And I think the reason why I'm asking people to do that is we still are holding these Victorian uh, mores in our head that purity has to do with, uh, like, the reason why we have to protect Joseph Smith, the reason why he's not a polygamist is because he can't have sex with other women. If if we keep thinking that way and keep talking about it that way, it diminishes the whole experience of polygamy for women. A lot of the plural wives, the majority of their life wasn't spent having sex. It was in this system of marriage that controlled aspects of their life in this life and in the next. And so as we're talking about polygamy, we're talking about power. This is a system of power. And so I always tell folks um, who are really trying to hold on to this Puritan idea of Joseph Smith, who was faithful to his wife. At the Let's say we take sex out of the whole thing and we're only talking about these relationships with these women. He is still completely abusing the power of the situation and their autonomy and their own power. So that's just, that's kind of my rant. Polygamy of course has to do with sex, but it's about power, especially in a kingdom of God organized around incentives and benefits for those who practice it. Beautiful. Okay. So with that, here's what we'll do. I'll start with the little image there. We'll go to slide number one of the program, but slide number two, you guys, in your outline. Uh, this is where the first, where we split these up into categories. The very first category is the revelations themselves. I was going to start with section 132, but Radio Free Mormon said, no, Bill Real, we have to go back a little further and go to good old section, old 101 that was removed. This was 1835 Book of Commandments, section CI, and 1844 DNC 101. So Radio Free Mormon, give us your thoughts on why this one was important. Right, and just uh, to state the obvious, CI is 101 okay. in Roman numerals. Roman numerals. 1835, the church feels it necessary to respond to allegations that are being made that people in the church are practicing fornication and polygamy. And so they have to repudiate it. So in as much as this church, this is verse four, in as much as this church of Christ has been reproached with the crime of fornication and polygamy, we declare that we're not doing any of that stuff. Right. And it's interesting, and I don't know if it's intentional, but it is interesting that there does appear to be some wiggle room in how it is set forth where it says we declare that we believe that one man should have one wife and one woman but one husband that seems pretty straightforward until you stop and look at it and say why is there a but where it says and one woman but one husband but before that when it's talking about that one man should have one wife it doesn't say but there I don't know if this is inartful drafting or if it's an intentional effort to provide wiggle room. But regardless, what is clear is that 
there are sufficient allegations being made against church members and probably leaders of fornication and polygamy that they feel they have to respond to it as early as 1835. Yeah, something is going on. Uh, it's in the air. So uh, any thoughts from you guys on this doc before I move to the next one? It is interesting. Oh, go. sorry. Go ahead, Lindsay. Go for it. Well, you, you go first. It is interesting to wonder what's going on behind the scenes, if this is a specific case or if this is just the, the confluence of a lot of things that have gone on. It's possible that Fanny Alger is behind this. Um, Don Bradley's research indicates that it was probably 1836 that that relationship took place, but there might have been some early beginnings of that at that time. That could be behind this. We really don't know what exactly is the genesis of this revelation specifically. Yeah. My what I was going to say is my theory involves Sidney Rigdon. And so when we're looking at the 1830s, especially, we have to remember it, it's hard for modern Mormons to look at it this way. But uh, many, many, many people saw Mormonism as Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon's church. It wasn't just Joseph Smith's church. Sidney Rigdon had a lot of power in developing theology. He was the one that spearheaded a lot of these documents. And he was very much uh, practicing his version of this new gospel, which, of course, was very traditional when it came to marriage. So we, I see a lot of Sidney Rigdon's influence in these early 1830s documents. Sweet. All right. So next is the actual Revelation 132 itself. This is dated 12 July, 1843. Uh, Revelation Nauvoo, Hancock County, Illinois, 12th of July, 1843, like I said, featured version copied. Uh, handwriting of Joseph Kingsbury. Uh, the first page bears a notation from Thomas Bullock in ink. And Bullock apparently, uh, I don't know what that word is, but paginated or paginated every odd page beginning with page three. The final page bears the stylized initials WR in graphite, likely standing for Willard Richards. Each page, including pages already numbered by Bullock, was paginated in graphite by an unidentified scribe. The word inside was also inscribed in graphite on the first page. The only reason this is important, because I think it sort of gives some provenance for the document. Um, in terms of making it uh, polygamy deniers, having Joseph Smith not be the author of polygamy, want to have this being a uh, written down page much later in the timeline. Revelation given through Joseph Smith, the prophet at Nauvoo, Illinois, again, they gave the date relating to the new and everlasting covenant, including the eternity of the marriage covenant and the principle of plural marriage. Although the revelation was recorded in 1843, evidence indicates that some of the principles involved in this revelation were known by the prophet as early as 1831. So you get the church's kind of official statement. And then I'll just read this, and then I'll ask you guys if you have any thoughts on this. But uh, C. Young's remark, this was I'm a sorry. footnote. To interrupt, Please. Bill, before you go on, that last yes. slide, where did you yeah. get that information? Is that from the Joseph Smith Papers Project? Um, I, I think so. I think this was off of Joseph Smith Papers Project page, yes. Okay, did you want to underscore that this is handwriting of Joseph Kingsbury? Yeah, and I think I, when I get done reading the next page, I think Brian will chime in, if I'm not mistaken, and he'll probably give us some provenance on this. Uh, a special conference of the elders, the provenance of the Kingsbury copy is mostly complete and its textual influence is traceable without much difficulty. With the death of Joseph and Hiram Smith, church historian Willard Richards assumed control of these materials in Joseph Smith's office and the historian's collections. While Emma Smith held ownership of materials in the Smith residence, known as the Mansion House, such as the Egyptian mummies and papyri connected to the Book of Abraham and the Bible revision manuscripts. Whitney may not have had custody of the Kingsbury copy in October 1843 when Joseph Smith apparently read the revelation to Brigham Young. Smith may have returned the Kingsbury copy after that. At any rate, Whitney held the Kingsbury copy in 1847 when Brigham Young requested it in March of that year. Young kept it in his possession, possession except for the use in publishing the extra. Uh, Richards may have copied the revelation sometime after August 1852. Joseph Kingsbury's own affidavit dated uh, 22 May 1886 on copying the Clayton original appears as Joseph C. Kingsbury affidavit 1886 May 22nd, probably before the manuscript passed to Young. Whitney's son, Horace K. Whitney, made a copy and perhaps two copies. One of the two may be a copy of the other. See the bibliographic notes uh, on these copies at the end of the addendum. So I'm going to back up a slide and uh, going to ask, you know, Brian, if you want to chime in, if any of the, you know, the other folks want to chime in, 
any thoughts on DNC 132 itself in terms of maybe Providence being the most important issue here? You will often hear polygamy deniers who will say this is problematic because this is a later copy. Well, true, we would like the original draft of it, but guess what? We'd also like the original draft of every one of Joseph Smith's revelations. That's a point that I don't think most people realize is we have zero original copies of the revelation, i.e. one that was dictated or created at that exact time. All we have are later copies, so this is by no means unusual. In this case, we have Joseph Smith's journal indicating that the revelation was occurred this day. You have Clayton's journal indicating that he was the one that wrote it down. And then we have the Kingsbury affidavit explaining how the copy took place. And then the story that we most likely understand is that Emma Smith was the one who destroyed the original. So we have perhaps actually the best documented revelation during Joseph Smith's lifetime. There's absolutely nothing suspicious about how it was created. Perfect. Any thoughts from you two or we can move on? I guess I would just say that the revelation itself, because it's written in the hands of two scribes, which was most of the documents of this time are written in someone else's hand. Joseph always had scribes around. Uh, because it is that is not evidence alone. We also have plenty of contemporary people talking about the revelation, knowing that there was one being told about it. So it's not just this text that we have as the document being uh, something that existed then. We have people talking about it as well. One question I should ask is, uh, do any of you know specifically how many pages this revelation took up on manuscript? Seems like Clayton's journal indicates that it was 10 pages in his version. Right? And that is accurate in terms of like what the Kingsbury copied the length of it. As I recall, it lines up pretty well. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, obviously, whatever size of paper you have is what size of paper you have. So right. that, could, that could be part of it. Yeah. There, I don't, I, there's nothing on that count, I think, to, to make it suspicious. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay, anything else here and we'll move on. I can't see what's written on that manuscript and I guess no one else can. I take it that this is a document that contains in Joseph Kingsbury's handwriting the substance of what is now section 132. Yep. You got it. It's exactly what it is. All right. Uh, we read the provenance. So now we're going to go to the Clayton Diaries and it feels as though Part of the argument on the other side is that maybe these were written late, that maybe they were altered, and uh, we should read these because they'll play a major role later on. So 9 March, 1843, uh, Thursday, uh, Thursday 9, at President Joseph Smith's office, walked out in the PM, he goes on and says more there. Um, he, he, he talks about how during this period of the prophet, Joseph frequently visited my house in my company and became well acquainted with my wife, Ruth, to whom I had been married five years. On day in the month of February 1843, date not remembered, 22nd, the prophet invited me to walk with him. During our walk, he said that he had learned that there was a sister back in England to whom I was very much attached. I replied there was, but nothing further than an attachment such as brother and sister in the church, such as a brother and sister in the church might rightfully entertain for each other. He then said, why don't you send for her? I replied, in the first place, I have no authority to send for her. And if I had, I have not the means to pay expenses. To this, he answered, I give you authority to send for her and I will furnish you with means, which he did. This was the first time the prophet talked with me on the subject of plural marriage. He informed me that the doctrine in principle was right in the sight of our heavenly father and that it was doctrine which pertained to celestial order and glory after giving me lengthy instructions and information concerning the doctrine of celestial or plural marriage he concluded his remarks by the words quote it is your privilege to have all the wives you want unquote after this introduction our conversations on the subject of plural marriage were very frequent and he appeared to take particular pains to inform and instruct me in respect to the principal, he also informed me that he had other wives living besides his first wife, Emma, and in particular gave me to understand that Eliza R. Snow, Louisa Beeman, Desdemona Fulmer, and others were his lawful wives in the sight of heaven. Again, 9 March, 1843. We don't have the original documents for this because the church has not as of yet released these, uh, though we are hearing, I guess, that that might be coming forward here soon. 
All right. Uh, anything on this particular entry? Otherwise, I can read the other three or four and we can kind of talk on them as a collective group. I wanted to ask Lindsay and Brian if my understanding is correct that these are representations of the diary of William Clayton that appear to all intents and purposes to have been contemporaneously recorded. One small clarifier on this graphic we've got here, it's just that very first paragraph that's from his journal. And then that second longer paragraph is actually from a later affidavit. That's the 1874 affidavit, right? Right. Yep. And that's that's the case with most of the stuff we have is we have contemporary documents. Then we also have these later affidavits that frequently flesh out the story. So that's the case here. Right. And it's going to get a lot better, I think, on the next slide with yep. things that are actually contemporaneous and not later recollections. Perfect. So the large amount of stuff I read was in a later uh, larger synopsis by William Clayton about his earlier journal entry. Perfect. Okay, so then we get May 1st, 1843, at the temple at 10, married Joseph to Lucy Walker, PM, at President Joseph's. He had gone out with Woodworth. Uh, and then May, 2nd May, 1843. Can you hang on a second, Bill? Please. I'm sorry, I want to ask the same question to Brian. Is this part of his journal contemporaneously recorded, or is this from his affidavit, which it looks like it might be? So all three of these here are um that note there that says affidavit refers to something that's going to come after it that's not shown here and that and key and our listeners keep that particular entry that first one in mind because we do actually have a good scan of that original page and so we that should is know from his journal okay you can see uh, it's the attorney in me that is focusing Please. on contemporaneously recorded utterances as opposed to something that he recalled 30 years later in 1874. Yeah, and when we get to the Lucy Walker one, we should note, right, that he's he's not using their full names. We're assuming it's Joseph and Lucy Walker. We'll see later it's just J and LW. Correct. But that is the 1843 actual journal entry. Yep, that's the original entry there. Yep. Yes. And then this one as well, 2nd May, 1843, May 2nd, talked with Jane Charnock, she loves me and would sooner unite to me than R. Joseph rode out today with Flora W. And if you remember our episode on uh, gold watches and land deeds, if this is Flora Woodworth, and we'll have more on that story later too. Uh, this one will become very important later on. 12 July, 1843, oh, Wednesday. Bill, just to state Please. an underscore. Mm -hmm. This is being written contemporaneously by um, Clayton. William Clayton. I'm sorry, just what's his first name? William Clayton, William. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, William. There's so many Williams. William Clayton. And he is married at this point to a lady named Ruth. Correct? Yep. So in that light, talked with Jane Charnock. She loves me and would sooner unite to me than somebody else with an, the initial R. It, it appears clear to me he's contemplating plural marriage, and that's what it's talking about here. Yeah, and in, this, and in the same journal entry, Joseph is spending some time with Flora Woodworth, who, if I'm not mistaken, is a 16-year-old girl uh, in Nauvoo. So then we've got 12 July, 1843, Wednesday, 12th, this a.m., I wrote a revelation consisting of 10 pages on the order of the priesthood, showing the designs in Moses, Abraham, David, and Solomon, having many wives and concubines. After it was wrote, Presidents Joseph and Hiram presented it and read it to E, which we assume is Emma, who said she did not believe a word of it and appeared very rebellious. J told me to deed all of the unencumbered lots to E and the children. He appears very he, he appears much troubled about E. And then we've got 4 September 1843. And uh, before you go to that bill, please. I don't mean to make this take all night, but yeah. this is crucial in my mind. Mm -hmm. This is the day, July 12th, 1843. And I think we've already had that date come up when we we're talking about the, um, well, the holograph by Joseph Kingsbury of section 132. This is the day it was allegedly received. And William Clayton was Joseph Smith's scribe. And in the journal, he makes a contemporaneous recording that says he spent in the morning receiving a revelation consisting of 10 pages 
on the order of the priesthood. That's a lot of revelation. It's almost as long, one might say, as section 132, which has 66 verses in them, and some of them quite long verses. And I know you're going to go on, but it, he's specifically describing what we can identify being familiar with section 132 as section 132, showing the designs in Moses, Abraham, David, and Solomon, all four, and I know you'll have it on the next slide mm -hmm. or shortly thereafter, mm -hmm. having many wives and concubines. That and after it was wrote, in Revelation. I mean, that's that's that that wording. Yes, and after it was wrote, Joseph and Hiram presented it and read it to Emma, who said she did not believe a word of it and appeared very rebellious. There's only one reason Emma would not believe a word of it and appear very rebellious is if this is the revelation that talks about the institution of plural marriage. She's not going to be upset with dynastic ceilings. And right. she's not going to be upset with any other interpretation that has nothing to do with the modern moment of doing polygamy. Yes. If this were a revelation that just talked about old times and how these fellows, Abraham, David, Solomon, and Moses, were justified, okay, fine. That's back then. That's hundreds and thousands of years ago. She's rebellious for a reason. And it's yeah. not because it's a lesson in ancient history. Right. So in the 4th September, 1843, had to haul water until the well was finished in September. The house apparently cost Clay. Well, I guess this is, is this a, is this a, what, do you know what this bottom one is, Brian? Yeah. You just have to keep reading a little bit further. I got you. Clayton cost to build. Little did he imagine the family would remain in the home for less than three years. Uh, borrow 1400 to clear his farm from encumbrance laying on it, which fact Esquire Skinner had ascertained on searching the records. President J told me he had lately had a new item of law revealed to him in relation to myself. He said the Lord had revealed to him that a man could only take two of a family except by express revelation. And as I had said, I intended to take Lydia. He made this known for my benefit to have more than two in a family was apt to cause wrangles and trouble. He finally asked if I would not give L which I again assume was to him. I said I would so far as I had anything to do in it, he requested me to talk to her. So two in a family means you you can have the mother, you can have the daughter, but you can't have the other, the, her sister now. You're you're limited to only two members of the family. Is that right, Lindsay? No, I think he could well, this, only take This has to do with Clayton because uh, Clayton, as we know now, is interested in bringing in other women and he runs into a problem early on where he is attracted to the same women that Joseph Smith is also interested in as well as other men. And so now it gets messy and they go, no, 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 no. We have to like, there's a limit and this number changes over time. But right now this is kind of the rule and it's because Clayton is some competition. Okay. All right. So then I guess, aren't we presuming then, and maybe you know more about it than I do. I'm sure you do both um, Lindsay and Brian, but that as of this point, William Clayton has already married two of Lydia's family. Yes, and that's that's where this more or less ad hoc rule comes from. Is Joseph says, "Sorry, you've reached your limit with this family because he wants her as a wife." So, okay. can we take okay. one very quick tangent here, just because I think listeners will be interested? They'll, they may notice that name Allen appears at the top of this. So this comes from Jim Allen's notes from the the Clayton journals. So incredibly briefly, what happens with William Clayton's journals? is they are not available to researchers for many years. Then in 1979, two employees of the historical department are allowed to see the originals. And they, uh, on their own apparently, decide to make a complete transcript of them. And what we have is somewhere around a quarter of that came to us by a, another researcher who was allowed to see their typescript in turn. And so what we are working with are notes from these original diaries. So it, while it is true we have not been able to see them, people have, and deniers sometimes say that, that historians have doubts about the Clayton Diaries. No. These people that were allowed to see them at the beginning and took these, these notes from them have no doubts about them whatsoever. Yeah, and I know this was a subject of some controversy when these were published in George D. Smith's An Intimate Chronicle where he published these notes that had been copied from the originals. Um, Am I correct that the church and its representatives have never disputed the accuracy of these notes? Nope. 
uh, in a review of that book, Jim Allen didn't love the way that these excerpts were used. He said that it, it sort of slanted the, the view of the journals as a whole by, by emphasizing the sensational. But no, there's, there's never been any doubt that these are accurate, legitimate excerpts from the original diaries. And I want to say something, and you can get the history of the Clayton journals on the Sense of Mormon History podcast. Brian and I do a series about this because Brian and I actually got to view Alan's notes and uh, find the, uh, the notes that he took on uh, Clayton's journal because up until that point, we had only had two other people who had seen it. So we were able to piece together Alan's notes. And uh, so we have seen those firsthand. We saw exactly what Alan recorded, which which back up. So you have three independent people uh, with different motives and different um, positionings in faith, having access to the journals and writing notes, and they're all consistent. Perfect. So as you guys hinted at, when we go to the next slide, William Clayton, I'll go back one just to make the point here. William Clayton talks about uh, 10 pages on the order of the priesthood showing the designs in Moses, Abraham, David, and Solomon, having many wives and concubines, etc. And when we go to DNC 132, RFM, what do we find? Exactly that in verse 1. Verily yeah. thus saith the Lord unto you, my servant Joseph, that inasmuch as you have inquired of my hand to know and understand wherein I, the Lord, justified my servants Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as also Moses, David, and Solomon, they get thrown in too. My servants, as touching the principle and doctrine of their having many wives and concubines. Yeah. Yeah. So you end up with what Clayton describes as in the Revelation is the beginning of section 132. And that'll be important because we'll get to other parts later on. Anything needs to be said here? Just because what we are doing tacitly is we're responding to the... Um, the other argument, which is this is something that Joseph Smith never did. He wasn't involved in. And this is something that was made up after the fact by Brigham Young. And he created this revelation and then said, this came from Joseph Smith when it really didn't. That's the other side. And that's what we are refuting by showing that contemporary diary entries during Joseph Smith's lifetime by his own scribe accurately describe what is in section 132 today. This was way before Brigham Young could have had any influence over it. Sweet. So now we get to the next section, which is going to be outside contemporary independent documents. So these are things that are completely unconnected from Brigham Young's influence. They kind of sit on their own. They're not really connected to other documents we'll show later. Um, so we end up with Oliver Cowdery's letter to his brother. I believe his brother's name is Warren. Yep, Warren Cowdery. Um, this is where he talks about the Fanny Elger uh, incident. He says, I never confessed, intimated, or admitted that I ever willfully lied about him when he was here. Talk, and that's Cowdery talking about Joseph Smith, Oliver Cowdery talking about Joseph Smith. When he was here, we had some conversation in which in every instance, I did not fail to affirm that what I had said was strictly true, a dirty, nasty, filthy scrape. And then scrape is kind of written over with the word affair. And that's written over in Warren Cowdery's handwriting. Because back in the day, you would send kind of letters back and forth to each other. And sometimes you'd use the same paper over and over again. Um, but in this instance, Warren makes his own note about a fair, which, by the way, scrape has that meaning. Uh, it's not like we're taking a completely foreign word that has nothing to do with a fair and, and changing it. But but scrape was the original word is overwritten. So affairs were overwritten in uh, Warren Cowdery's handwriting. Of I was his just going to say, I'm sorry, Bill. I think oh, no, scrape please. has it has, doesn't have any, any sexual connotation. It's just a jam or a difficult position that somebody has gotten themselves into. Okay. And of his and Fanny Elgers was talked over in which I strictly declared that I had never deviated from the truth on the matter. And as I suppose was admitted by himself. Uh, any thoughts on this document, but it does again, hint to a little ambiguously because of the word scrape, but, uh, we have this incident in church history where Joseph Smith is approaching a maid in his home, Fanny Elger. Um, whether the relationship is part of plural marriage or uh, something else, that I think is heavily debated. But there is some incident where Joseph does have a run-in with the woman in his home, Fanny Elger. I just wanted yeah, to state for the... Yeah, it's not just this document, document that backs that up. There are contemporary uh, sources who talk about a scandal. There was definitely a scandal with Fanny and the Smith household. 
uh, which if you follow Don Bradley's work, um, who was, you know, a faithful, some would say an apologist, he's a great researcher of Fanny Al Alger's life. You can look that up, but it was definitely uh, a known scandal. And again, um, I don't think it was over him for getting to pay her or something. The scandal involved Emma. Everyone seemed to know that it was a, a sexual nature. Right. For the okay. record, I just want to say, Bill, if you didn't say it before, that this letter from Oliver to his brother Warren Cowdery was dated January 21st, 1838. Perfect. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next one if no one has anything. All right, so then we have the happiness letter. Uh, we've all heard this phrase in uh, in church talks at one time or another. Happiness is the object and design of our existence and will be the end thereof if we pursue the path that leads to it. And this path is virtue, uprightness, faithfulness, holiness, and keeping all the commandments of God. On the 3rd of August, 1842, John C. Bennett, formerly a close associate of Joseph Smith, forwarded to the editor of the Springfield, Illinois, Sangamo Journal, the text of a letter he claimed Joseph Smith wrote to Nancy Rigdon, daughter of Sidney and Phoebe Brooks Rigdon. I know that um, there's, a, I think, a Dirk mod out there who's uh, debated whether the provenance of this is legit. For anybody who's interested, I would highly suggest on YouTube, find Mormon Discussions, uh, interview with Jonathan Streeter and Chris Smith, where we go through all of the data, put up all of the historical documents, and Streeter and Smith do a beautiful job of showing the connections of the happiness letter. It contains a ton of Joseph Smith's theology in the wording of the letter and the context of the letter and the things going on in Nauvoo at the time, um, I think place a heavy emphasis on this letter being legit. Uh, I'm happy to hear what you three have to say about it. Um, but again, I would recommend everybody go check out that podcast to understand the full scope of the uh, happiness letter. It was a letter that was used to essentially shame Nancy Rigdon and to put pressure on her since she was turning down Joseph Smith's advances. And again, one more thing to, to note about this. It's not just the document itself that backs this up. If you look at all of the other circumstances around Rigdon's family at the time, uh, it backs up the entire story. Rigdon actually goes head to head with Joseph Smith eventually over this. He loses a lot. Their family is mistreated quite publicly. It's not uh, a very well kept secret. So even if you want to dismiss these documents, all you have to do is look at the circumstances involving the people around the documents, which will also back up the documents. Yeah. Okay. Then the next one here, that's the happiness letter close up. If you want to read the whole thing, you're welcome to, you can simply push pause and read it. I think it's at least big enough. If you make it full screen, you'll be able to do that. Um, Okay, so then we move on to some more things from John C. Bennett. John C. Bennett wrote an expose uh, published in 1842. It really started to be widespread in 1843. John C. Bennett, uh, History of the Saints, an expose, Joe Smith in Mormonism. And in this uh, book, John C. Bennett names, although he doesn't put in all the letters, he names uh, several of the plural wives of Joseph Smith. He says, but I desist. In concluding this subject, however, I will semi-state two or three more cases among the vast number where Joe Smith was privately married to his spiritual wives. In the case of Mrs. A. S. by Apostle Brigham Young, and in that of Mrs. or Miss L. B. by Elder Joseph Bates Noble, then there are cases of Mrs. B., Mrs. D., Mrs. S., Mrs. G., Mrs. B., et cetera, et cetera. All of them but two we know the names of who those folks are. For example, Mrs. Louise, Miss Louisa Beeman. And you have to understand that the spelling of names isn't consistent in the 1840s, but for the most part, he has the exact amount of asterisk as are the remaining letters of the name. And in one of the two instances where we didn't know the name, if you remember the episode on Flora Woodworth, we did. I did an episode immediately following where we looked at some land deeds, which we'll get to later, where we also figured out what we think is the name of one of those last two missing ones as well. Um, so there's this part of John C. Bennett's book where in 1842, he is publishing the names of the plural wives. And these are the same names that hold up in all of the other documentation that these are uh, listed within uh, the historical context as being plural wives of Joseph Smith. 
anything you guys want to say about John C. Bennett's part of his book here? Bennett is one that is seemingly very easy to discredit because, of course, he becomes disenchanted as an excommunicated. But he clearly did know some things. And these cases are fascinating. Um, a few years ago, Lindsay and I did a panel with our friend John Dinger, who talked about slander laws at the time and indicated that the reason that he does asterisks here were very likely so that he would avoid being sued because it does give him somewhat of a plausible deniability. But the case, that very first one where he says that Brigham Young performs the marriage is fascinating because it's very clear he's referring to Agnes Smith. That's why she's Mrs. because she's already married. Brigham Young's journal, which is very scant, thankfully does have an entry for him apparently performing the marriage. We say apparently because it's written in a Masonic cipher, which is just fun. I also want to say that John C. Bennett, although he's the bad guy in Mormon history, he's one of the worst scoundrels from the faithful point of view because he wrote this expose. But he also wasn't just some schmo on the street. He was a counselor in the first presidency with Joseph Smith. He was in a position to know what was going on. And wasn't he the mayor of Nauvoo before Joseph Smith was the mayor of Nauvoo? I think so. Yeah. He also invented ketchup, modern ketchup. So. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Look at that. We have Sounds... so much to owe him. He French really fries made the tomato the happen in the United States. So if you eat tomatoes, it's a nod to the sleeves bucket, John C. Bennett. Sweet. Well, we're not done there with Bennett. Bennett also includes an affidavit from Martha Brotherton. So in the book is this long, detailed uh, text of Martha Brotherton's letter to John C. Bennett, which also includes, by the way, a sort of notarized statement at the end where it's done in the presence of another person. I think this was done over in England, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I do include the close-up parts of the pertinent spot. So um, if we remember, if we remember the story, and some of you may have never heard this, but there's a story in church history where uh, Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball are walking Martha Brotherton uh, out to, I think, Heber C. Kimball's home. And there seems to be kind of a debate between Brigham and Heber that they both sort of want to be with her. And uh, Brigham ends up uh, getting her alone in a room and locks the door. And uh, that's bad enough, but then we have her statement. This is in her affidavit about the interaction that Joseph Smith had in this situation. So I'll read here. Well, said Young, Sister Martha would be willing if she knew it was lawful and right before God. Well, Martha, said Joseph, it is lawful and right before God. I know it is. Look here, sis. Don't you believe in me? I did not answer. And this is Martha Brotherton's word. So she's the one saying that. I did not answer. Well, Martha, said Joseph, just go ahead and do as Brigham wants you to. He is the best man in the world except me. Oh, said Brigham, then you are as good. Yes, said Joseph. Well, said Young, we believe Joseph to be a prophet. I have known him near eight years and always found him the same. Yes, said Joseph. And I know that this is lawful and right before God. And there is, and if there is any sin in it, I will answer for it before God. And I will have the keys of the kingdom, and whatever I bind on earth is bound in heaven, and whatever I loose on earth is loosed in heaven. And if you will accept of Brigham, you shall be blessed. God shall bless you, and my blessing shall rest upon you. And if you will be led by him, you will do well, for I know Brigham will take care of you. And if he don't do his duty to you, come to me, and I will make him. And if you do not like it in a month or two, come to me and I will make you free again. And if he turns you off, I will take you on. And then I'll skip down just a little bit here. Well, then said Joseph, what are you afraid of, sis? Come, let me do the business for you. In other words, he'll take care of doing the marriage. Um, I know it's in John C. Bennett's history, his book. So folks who want to dismiss Bennett will probably have in their mind an easy time doing this. But this letter is highly detailed. And it has a, it's sworn before another witness. Um, and uh, the story, again, as Lindsay said, with the happiness letter, the story matches up with some other things in church history too. But thoughts from you three on the letter from Martha Brotherton. I have a couple of thoughts. 
The first one is this is a contemp this presents itself or is presented as a contemporaneous affidavit in a book that was published during Joseph Smith's lifetime. My question is, it would seem that the only way to discount this would be to say that John C. Bennett made it up. But then my question is, if he made it up, did Martha Brotherton ever repudiate it? No. So in fact, Martha Brotherton records this before getting in touch with John C. Bennett. So it's something that Martha Brotherton held to and her sister verified as well. And um, it's, it's just one narrative. There were a few times where polygamy, where these men, Joseph Smith would approach women and it would go south. And this is one of them. The Rigdon story is another. There are a few, uh, uh, a Pratt is another one. And what I think is interesting about this account is it follows the pattern of how Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. Brigham Young, by the time he is in charge, the reason why you know he's not the instigator is by the time it's institutionalized and they're practicing it, Brigham Young doesn't need to go through all of this cloak and dagger locking people in rooms. This is Joseph Smith's pattern. This is what Joseph Smith does. And we know this not just from people who are upset and leave the church and go and write, you know, go to the newspaper about it. It's from the faithful people too. They're approached in similar ways. So it fits a pattern that modern days would call grooming, right? It's setting them up. They have something to lose, as we're going to talk about in some of the other documents. So that's that's part of it. And I also think that um, we have to realize that Joseph Smith at this point in Nauvoo is a national sensation. People like to think it's like this small thing in Nauvoo. People love to write stories about him in the press. And so her going to the newspaper on this is not unusual for the time. Joseph Smith was a fascination and there were people making up all kinds of rumors about him that weren't necessarily true. People that had no distance, no, con no uh, connection to him. But this is an example of someone who did. And again, the pattern of how Joseph Smith approaches even his most devoted friends and their wives later on fits this exact script. Yeah. Bennett is problematic. And there's no way of getting around that. I don't think there's anyone that's going to argue otherwise. But again, like we said, there's contextual data around this particular story that that seems to, to nail it down pretty well. And the thing is, is even if you did want to argue this particular case, it comes in the context of all these other things that we're talking about. And that's important to remember is that none of these single things can be taken just by itself. It's one of many, 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 many accounts that comes together as a tapestry weaving this whole story together. Yeah. I was just going to say that that affidavit is dated July 13th, 1842. Yep. 13th, July, 1842. You got it. Yeah. The book comes out just a couple months after that. And then he starts a lecture tour back East because like Lindsay said, this is big national news. People want to hear about this. Yeah. Okay, now we get to Melissa Lott's uh, marriage. So we have the family Bible, correct? And what we know, and thank you, Brian, for, for helping me put this together. On this date of 20 September 1843, Cornelius P. Lott, who managed Joseph Smith's farm, was married for time and eternity to his wife, Permelia Darrell Lott, by Hiram Smith, with the seal of President Joseph Smith. Lott's daughter, Melissa may have been married or sealed to Joseph Smith on this date as well, though primary sources identify the date of Joseph and Melissa Lott's sealing are either incomplete or contradictory. But what we end up with is <clears throat> we have a document that shows that Joseph Smith went to his farm, which was managed by Cornelius Lott, on 20 September 1843. And then we've got the Lott family Bible that says... Uh, Parent that says about the parents says their names and it says quote gave their daughter Melissa to wife and this is also dated 20 September 1843. The parents were sealed by Hiram Smith that day, but we know Joseph Smith is there at the farm that day as well. Uh, any thoughts on this piece of evidence? The thing I find fascinating about this is what's missing. Yeah, which is the husband's name, huh? It's a family Bible you're putting in the records of the family members. And under normal circumstances, you wouldn't just say that you they gave their daughter Melissa to wife 
they would say to whom she was married. But for some reason, they omit that. And in the context of Joseph Smith being there. Yeah. And Melissa Lott, all throughout her life, in multiple places, uh, acknowledges that she was a plural wife of Joseph Smith. And in fact, she's one of the two women, along with Eliza Snow, who informs Andrew Jensen of the of a large chunk of the plural wives' names. And also the, oh, sorry, go, ahead. go for it, Lindsay. I was just going to say, it's important, too, to pay attention for those who might not. It, it's obvious to us, but maybe not to everyone. The, the fact that the parents are sealed on the same day, that's important. And the reason why it's important is because Joseph Smith has a practice, especially with these early marriages, of trading favors is what it's called, where he will trade eternal salvation for parents like his friends, Heber Kimball, for their daughter, right? And so the reason why we're pointing that out is you can draw pretty parallel lines between a lot of his marriages and the favors the eternal blessings that are given to family members, brothers, uh, parents, sometimes uh, Emma Smith. <laughs> so those those uh, dates are also important. Beautiful. Yep. Actually, we get a very good comparison to that with William Clayton. When he marries Diantha Farr, um, for whom Come Come Ye Saints is later written, he describes how that day that he was sealed to her, her parents were sealed together. So yeah, this is definitely a pattern. And then on Melissa's here, uh, the name of the husband is only partially missing because you notice in the next column over, when she then marries again after Joseph Smith's death, she's described as Melissa Smith. So they, they kind of forgot to disguise them completely there. Oh, look at that. The, the, is that the very top there? Yep, the very top right, Melissa Smith. Good point. Mm, thank you. Wouldn't have caught that. Perfect. That I think that cinches the deal. As far as I'm concerned, trying to look at yeah. this as objectively as possible. Yeah. Unless there's a cottage industry forging family Bibles out there that I'm not aware of. So. Right. Yeah. And if people can't see this, and that would be people listening to this on audio, this comes in a list of handwritten comments about marriages under the yeah. name family record. If anybody doesn't know this, that's what you used to do with your Bibles. You had pages that were provided at the beginning of the Bible to record such things. And this occurs smack dab in the middle of a bunch of other notations. This is not something that was later written in after the fact, because that would have been impossible to do after the next line was written. Yeah, perfect. Okay, I'm gonna move on to the next one. So then we've got the document Brian mentioned earlier, Joseph's marriage to Lucy Walker. And so I've got the box around it in red but it is married J to LW. And for folks who don't know the story of Lucy Walker, I would also recommend again, uh, you can go listen to Vera Polygamy. I'm sure there's other places where you can find it. Mormon Discussion did an episode where we talked about uh, the Holy Ghost, but used Lucy Walker as an example. She gives a very detailed story of what happened to her, much of it in terms of Lindsay talking about patterns of behavior. Uh, Lucy Walker loses her mother to illness. Joseph Smith comes along, sends the dad on a mission, and then uh, takes in the oldest uh, four children, I believe. The youngest two are the sisters, Lucy being the youngest of the four oldest taken into the home. And Joseph takes these two sisters out into public and introduces them as his daughters. He is taking care of them in a father-daughter relationship while the dad is on a mission and he's the one who sent the dad on a mission. And then a short time later, when uh, Lucy turns, I think she either went from 15 to 16 or 16 to 17, Joseph approaches her and now is giving her 24 hours to decide uh, to be his plural wife. She goes uh, back to her sleeping quarters, uh, gets through the night, doesn't get an answer, comes back to Joseph tells him she's not decided yet. He says, I'll give you 24 more hours or the gates of heaven shall be closed against you. She goes back for 24 more hours. So at this point, we can assume safely, I think, that she is not sleeping well. So she goes 48 hours without sleep and then comes back to Joseph reporting having had a spiritual experience and accepts to be a plural wife of Joseph Smith. And, and this is from her own words. And I think she documents her history at least on two occasions. Um, thoughts from you guys on this document? 
Yeah, this one is is one I think one of the most predatory um, examples of Joseph Smith's polygamy because she's an orphan and and Lucy does believe and it is suggested to her and she talks about this later on that her mother who had just died is uh, is linked to her eternal salvation. And so she she isn't just accepting plural marriage for herself. She is uh, going to want to see her mother again. And that's how she's viewing it at the time. And not only is she very young, she's orphaned. She's dependent on Joseph Smith, like you said. They're considered family. Her older brother, I believe, uh, is employed by Joseph Smith. And the employment that he is getting and his benefit of money is helping the younger siblings. So she has a lot of reasons to stay in good favor, even though it makes her sick at first. And I think it's it's very tragic. Yeah. And Brian, I oh, go ahead, RFM. I was going to ask, is this William Clayton's journal? Yes. This is because, one of because the Because there's a nice timestamp. Oh, I'm sorry, Brian. Go, no, ahead. No, go, ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I love the timestamp. May 1st, 1843. On the opposing page, we've got the Kinderhook plate. Yep. We've got the tracing of the Kinderhook plate. We've got the writing all around it. It obviously was placed on there before that page was written on, and it is intact and facing this other page. So that alone can date it, at least the right page, to May 1st. And the left page apparently was the same date on which Joseph married Lucy Walker. Yeah, our, our good friend Brent Metcalf was, I think, the first one that brought this to everyone's attention. And this was before uh, we were able to actually see the page ourselves. This is so fascinating. It comes from a chapter on the Kinderhook Plates in a very good book called Producing Ancient Scripture. So this was a sideline to what they were talking about. But yeah, that that it's really difficult to argue how a tracing that matches the one surviving Kinderhook Plate exactly matches the dimensions of this cannot be a contemporary diary entry because those plates were in Nauvoo for, I believe, a week only. So that one is fairly difficult to argue away. Yeah. Brian, in, in, what is the language that's marked out in red on the left page? What does that say? So that's where it says MJ to LW and then the date before that, May 1st. So, yeah, and that's that's again goes to show that clearly they're recording it but they know <laughs> Lindsay and i talk about this all the time mormons are terrible at keeping secrets right we write things backwards or we flip them around and think that no one will ever be able to figure out our, our secret code everyone knows what we're talking about right anytime he's writing m it's married j is always joseph and lw if we had nothing else we might not know what was going on but thanks to later affidavits and these other things that that line up date wise we know this is lucy walker yeah. Lucy Walker gives very detailed accounts about what happened to her. And as Lindsay is pointing out patterns with lots of the women that Joseph takes on as plural wives, there's not only these patterns of trade-offs, but there's also these patterns of giving these young women or at other times, uh, adult women, but young girls, uh, a certain time period in which to decide whether they're going to be a plural wife of Joseph's or not. And also with a negative promise that if they don't decide there will be some sort of spiritual penalty for not doing so and this is a girl who just lost her mom who wants to see her again on the other side and those penalties obviously like like she mentioned apply to the family as well so it's it's not just them it's yeah. the eternal salvation of their families as a whole i mean that's incredible pressure for an orphan teenage girl to have to bear up under yeah okay so now we get to the land deeds. And this was something we discovered when we did the Flora Woodworth episode. I don't remember how I even came across them, but I went onto the Joseph Smith Papers website and I came across all the land deeds that were available. They have a, a page where you could look them up and you could search them by year. There's only so many pieces of land that were given to women by themselves. And I, I don't remember the number. I should have gone back and counted them, but I'm going to guess it's somewhere in the range of about 15 or so in 1842, 1843, and the beginning of 1844, where a woman without anyone else listed on the land deed in terms of adults gets a piece of land to herself. And what I also noticed was at least 75% of them, I think it was higher than that, but at least 75% of them were plural wives of Joseph Smith. 
And so the moment you make that connection, you begin to sense what's that something's going on here. And so one of them is the deed we found for that episode, which is Flora Woodworth. When she was 16 years old, she gets a piece of land from Joseph Smith to her on the 13th of May, 1843. Thoughts from you guys before I go through the rest of these. That was the part that I just wanted to underscore is that the way things were set up, that the church was Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith owns the property. He has the ability to sell it or give it to whomever he wishes. And that's the only thing I wanted to make clear was that these deeds are being given by Joseph Smith to different people. And in this case, to Flora Ann Woodworth on 13 May, 1843, which I guess would have been 12 days. Is it Flora Woodworth? No, it's Lucy Walker who got married. It's easy to get these things confused, isn't it? But here's a girl who's 16 years old and Joseph Smith is deeding her a piece of property in Nauvoo. Yeah. And I just want to um, say he's not just dating it as a, as like a prophet, a church leader and the people are, it's not like law of consecration. They're like giving their land a free. He also has a uh, civic power at this point. So Joseph Smith is operating as both prophet, but he's also op operating as the city planner. So, so I just want to point that out. It's not just people giving it because they believe in God. It's an actual, he has political power at this point. And, and just to know, just to note the unethicalness of personally giving property to people when the property actually belongs to the church. So just to note that the the unethical use of church money and property isn't just a modern thing that Mormonism does. So let me ask the obvious question. Why is Joseph Smith giving property to a 16-year-old? Yeah. Why? There's the pause. None of us have a good answer for that. And by the way, when you look at the amounts of these, I found only a handful of them that were high amounts, like a thousand dollar piece of land. Now, whether the piece was any bigger or not, I don't know. But the ones that he put a value on of a thousand dollars, all of them were plural wives except for one. And that one was the new plural wife that we discovered in the Flora Woodworth episode. Hmm. So I'll get to that one in a moment. Um, but there and were like four also that were thousand dollars. Also, the question then becomes, if this is something that was made up later by Joseph Smith and retroactively claimed that Joseph, excuse me, by Brigham Young, and then he claims later on that Joseph Smith is the one who did it, if that's all true, then how is Brigham Young going back and forging these deeds yeah. from Joseph Smith to these women? Yeah, that would be absurd. One, one last thing. We've talked about this with John Dinger, too, on our podcast, but... It's also in a context where women cannot own property without their husband. So I think that that's important to remember too. Perfect. So let's go through the rest of these. So I did mark down the ages of the women as this is going on. Um, there were a few plural wives who were listed with members of their family. I excluded those. I'm only looking at deeds given to a woman on her own. You have a deed to Sarah Ann Whitney, 6 September 1842. She is 17 years old at the time. She gets a piece of land. You have a deed to Patty Bartlett Sessions to her alone. She is 48 years old at the time. You have a deed to Mary Elizabeth Rawlings Leitner. If you remember, the church tells us this beautiful story about how she saved the Book of Commandments in her dress, but the church never tells you that she was approached. She says she was approached when she was 12 years old by Joseph Smith, that she would someday be his plural wife. And, and in fact, years later, did become his plural wife, she gets a piece of land by herself at 25 years old. Deed to Helen Marr Kimball, who's 14 years old at the time, she gets a piece of land deeded to her all by herself, 7th June, 1843. Deed to Sylvia Sessions Lyon, 24 years old at the time, 5 June, 1843. Deed to Sarah Scott Mulholland, we don't know anything beyond the ceiling, if you look on Wikipedia, you'll see that Sarah Scott is listed. She gets a deed to herself all on her own. Elizabeth Davis Durfee, she'll turn 52 one, de one day after the deed's date. So happy birthday to Elizabeth Durfee. On the 10th of March, 1843, she gets a piece of land all on her own. Nancy or Miranda Nancy Johnson Hyde, 28 years old at the time of the deed. She gets a piece of land all by herself. Remember, there's only so many times this happens and almost every time 
it is what uh, historians would say is a verified plural wife of Joseph Smith. Here's the one we discovered, by the way. Deed to Jane Gully, and her name sometimes has an E-Y and sometimes it's just a Y after the L's. But Deed to Jane Gully for $1,000. We don't know anything else about her other than John C. Bennett list a Mrs. G. Um, but but the fact that it's a woman getting land on her own and the amount is in the $1,000 range, which all the rest of them were, uh, I am almost certain this is a plural wife of Joseph Smith, and it's the one that John C. Bennett names, for which Fawn Brody also guessed it was a gully, but the data showed that, that it couldn't have been that woman. Uh, so I think Fawn Brody actually got the last name correct, just not the right gully. And then if you remember in the beginning, we talked about this uh, William well, Bill, Clayton diary. Yes. Um, something about the deeds that you've just gone over. Please. When it says $1,000, it appears that this is being presented as a legitimate land transaction. The woman is paying $1,000 or however much in exchange yeah. for a plot of land. Do you have any thoughts about that, Lindsay or Brian? Is this something that's real or is this something that's just used to make it look valid and not suspicious was by the way before you, yeah before you yeah before you comment i think what you're saying rfm is there's no way in hell helen mark kimball paid money for a lot of land or jane gully gave a thousand dollars and so was there any actual transfer of cash for land right and i think that's probably going to end up being speculative and yet i wanted to hear the opinions of our guests mm. I don't know about the the exchange of money um, and where it came from. I do know, again, that women, I, I believe it wasn't in Illinois until 1844, where they actually passed the law. But as early as 1839, laws started to get passed that women could only own property if they were married. And so that's what's really interesting about these deeds here. Um, that they're, con they're considered legitimate, yet some of these women are considered single. Um, publicly. And I think that that's an interesting thing to note. Yeah. Wait. Some of the, the listeners might have noticed, wait a minute, so aren't half of those women actually civilly married and they aren't. So the fact that they're being deeded land, not to them and their civil husband, but to them alone is quite telling. That makes mm. that case that much stronger. Well, this just shows how progressive Joseph Smith was. Allowing Almost. women to hold property in their own name before it was legal. Even Joseph Smith wasn't above Illinois law. He tried to be, yeah. but he wasn't. So then I think we get to some really interesting things here. And we go back to the William Clayton Journal. If you remember what we read earlier, Wednesday 12th, this AM, I wrote a revelation consisting of 10 pages on the order of the priesthood, showing the designs in Moses, Abraham, David, and Solomon, having many wives and concubines. After it was wrote, Presidents Joseph and Hiram presented it and read it to Emma, who said she did not believe a word of it and appeared very rebellious. Joseph told me to deed all of the unencumbered lots to Emma and the children. He appears much troubled about Emma. So me wondered what would happen if I went and found Emma Smith's land deed. And what I find is that she's given all of the unencumbered lots in Nauvoo. So I'll read about a third of these. There's no sense in reading all of it, but I'll read about a third of these. Uh, hereby acknowledge, doth hereby grant, bargain, sell, convey, and confirm unto the said Emma Smith, Julia M. Smith, Joseph Smith Jr., Frederick G., uh, William Smith, and Alexander Smith, their heirs and assigns forever all those tracts or parcels of land situate and being in the county of Hancock in the state of Illinois, and described on the plot of the city of Nauvoo as being lot number three in block number 93, also lot number four in block number 94, also lots number one, two, and three in block number 95, also block number 96, also block number 97, also block number 98, also lots number one and two in block number 99, also lot number four in block number 104, also lots number two and three in block number 109, also block number 110, also lot number three in block number 111, also lot number three in block number 
112. I'll stop there. That's about a third of them. As you can easily see, Emma Smith got all of the un unencumbered lots, which then adds additional credibility to William Clayton's journal enter entry that he was absolutely speaking the truth. Right. If we can track him down and corroborate that he's correct in one part of this contemporaneous diary entry, which you have done, then it gives additional weight to the rest of it. And we've already talked about how the first part of this brief entry matches what we have in section 132, at least in a general sense. But now he's talking about all these deeds and the date of all those deeds was the same date, July 12th, 1843. Yeah. Sweet. Anything from I mean, you if you're on Emma, this? if you're okay. Emma, this cannot be a secret to her that Joseph Smith is deeding lots to his plural wives. And I can see not only does she want to make sure that she is taken care of in the event of a divorce over this issue, but I can see her also trying to circumvent Joseph Smith from giving any more lots away to plural wives by having all the rest of the unencumbered lots given to her. Yeah. So one of the tragedies about Emma's uh, property ownership is Illinois is doesn't even pass laws to protect women who own property until 1861. And so when Joseph dies, the next two years and part of the big fallout with Brigham Young is over this property because you say Emma couldn't have not known. She actually didn't know. She trusted her husband. Her husband was uh, making it seem as if things were on the up and up. You can see in Clayton's journals when he's spending time with her, she's focusing on other things that they're doing inventory of prop of uh, supplies, but not necessarily property and businesses, which is where her focus is. When he dies, it becomes clear to her, wait a minute, I thought I was protected and I'm not. And so she spends those next two years and it's not until the 1860s that she, is, she would have actually been protected in these laws and she doesn't have those legal protections at that time. In that chaotic period, Clayton summarizes it that all of the debts are in Joseph Smith's personal name, whereas all the property, the useful stuff, is in the church's name. And Emma's no dummy. She was a much better business person than Joseph Smith probably was. And she sees what's happening. And with all these things we just talked about, is like, now hold on here. Well, I'm, you're not taking away all the good stuff and saddling me with all the debt. Okay, very okay. good. Well, I note here that we're not even halfway through. We are going to get through everything else. But I want to stop at this point and say that already I think there's an overwhelming case presented so far that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. Yeah, thank you, RFM. All right, so we've got the deed to Emmett. Now we go to the Nauvoo High Council uh, minutes of meetings and those affidavits. Uh, Hiram reads, the, the history says that Hiram read a, the plural marriage revelation to the Nauvoo High Council. On Saturday, August 12, 1843, Hiram Smith was in a meeting of the Nauvoo Stake High Council when the conversation turned to marriage. Hiram, apparently still of the impression that, quote, the doctrine is so plain I can convince any reasonable man or woman of its truth, unquote, excused himself to obtain the copy of the revelation, returning to the High Council, Hiram proceeded to read the revelation. Now that's what the story is. Let's find out if that actually holds up and is true. Well, first off, we have the Nauvoo High Council meeting minutes. And in those minutes, uh, we can note that it says, council met according to adjacent at Hiram Smith's office, no business before the council, teaching by President Hiram Smith and William Marks, adjourned till next Saturday, two o'clock. So we, Hosea Stout's the clerk, by the way. So we can say with, certainty that Hiram Smith is at that meeting and that he's teaching, but we don't yet know if that's what he's teaching. Uh, we do get words from Hosea Stout because we wonder why the uh, document doesn't have more information. And so Hosea Stout later on in his life explained, uh, Hosea Stout, who was keeping the minutes later, explained that he had to leave the meeting early and that's why the minutes are so terse. He figured the revelation would be submitted and he could read it at length later. So there's not much said, but we do at least get that Hiram Smith was there and he taught the Nauvoo High Council something. Well, we can go to uh, the folks who were there. Who's at the meeting? William Marks, who is the Nauvoo stake president. We've got Austin Cowles, who is one of, I believe, uh, his counselors. We've got Samuel Bent, Alpheus Cutler, George Harris, Dunbar Wilson, William Huntington, Levi Jackman, Aaron Johnson, Thomas Grover, David Fulmer, 
James Allred and Leonard Sobey. Of those, James Allred, David Fulmer, Thomas Grover, Aaron Johnson, Leonard Sobey, and Austin Cowles documented the meeting in letters and affidavits. Uh, so I'm going to go now to James Allred, who left, I think, a couple of documents for us. But in this one, he writes this on the 15th of October, 1854. He was one of Joseph Smith's bodyguards. He was faithful to the LDS faction, though he never took a plural wife himself. He said, at a meeting of the High Council in Nauvoo, September 23rd, 1843, Brother Hiram Smith read the revelation relating to the plurality of wives. He said he did not believe it at first. It was so contrary to his feelings, but he said he knew Joseph was a prophet of God, so he made covenant that he would not eat, drink, or sleep until he knew for himself that he had got a testimony, that it was true, that he had even had the voice of God concerning it. Just to note, RFM and I were talking about this earlier, James Allred is stating what Hiram Smith said and taught. So it's Hiram who said he would not eat or drink or sleep until he knew for himself that he had got a testimony that it was true, that he had had the voice of God concerning it. I just want to note, again, if this is dynastic ceilings, or this is not having to do with the modern moment, which we'll play in later, there's zero reason for people to be, uh, what does it say here? Um, it was contrary to his feelings, and he did not want to believe it at first. The only reason you have those kinds of feelings inside of you is because whatever you're asked to do is not sitting well. And that has nothing to do with dynastic ceilings or having to place this uh, situation in some other point in time. Any thoughts on James Allred? Otherwise, I'll move on to the next one. Oops. Just one general comment that uh, um, we don't have any journal entries from anyone involved in the, either the stake presidency or the high council, which is unfortunate, but again, not unusual. Right. And even though this is 1854, the strength of it lies in the fact that we can document that James Allred, being on the Nauvoo High Council, would have been present for the meeting. So the least we can say is that he was present and in a position to hear what it was that Hiram Smith taught, according to the minutes. And this is what he says happened. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to the next one. James Allred has a second affidavit. Don't need to read it. It says the same thing that the first one does. Uh, I do put a close-up there of it so that if folks want to, you can feel free to push pause and you can read that. It's in really clean handwriting because this is the, it was the same hand, it was the same person doing the handwriting for all of these affidavits uh, and it's very easily readable. Then we get to David Fulmer. David Fulmer is also goes with the LDS faction of Mormons. He is a advocate for polygamy. He sides with the revelation and is with uh, the Brighamites. Uh, David Fulmer has his, and he essentially says the exact same thing. I'll read here that on or about the 12th day of August, 1843, while in meeting with the high council, uh, he being a member thereof in parentheses, uh, in Hiram Smith's brick office in the city of Nauvoo, County of Hancock, state of Illinois, Dunbar Wilson made inquiring in uh, relation to the subject of the plurality of wives as there were, were, there were rumors afloat uh, reporting it. And he was satisfied there was something in these rumors, and he wanted to know what it was, upon which the said Hiram Smith stepped across the road to his residence and soon returned, bringing with him a copy of the revelation on celestial marriage given to Joseph Smith on July 12th, 1843, and read the same to the high council and the testimony and gave, I'm sorry, bore testimony to its truth. Also, this reminded me, the date that Clayton put in his journal about the unencumbered lots is also the exact same day because he, um, you can tell by the journal entry that Emma's rebellious and they need to do something quick. The lot deeded to Emma Smith was on the exact same day, by the way, just a note. Okay, so we have David Fulmer. Um, this is a second affidavit by David Fulmer, but not really. And Brian explained this to me earlier, and, and I'll say it, Brian, but if you want to jump in after and correct anything, please do, that they were making multiple copies of the same affidavit. So this is word for word. The one we saw on the previous screen, it just takes up different spaces on the lines. 
because they were making more than one copy in case something happened to the original. But we do get another uh, testimony of David Fulmer. So this would be what I would call affidavit number three, but it's actually number two. Uh, he says, we hereby jointly, and this is on October 10th, 1869. The previous one was on the 15th of June, 1869. We hereby jointly and severe, uh, severally certify that on the 12th day of August, 1843, Hiram Smith presented to the high council in his brick office, Nauvoo assembled the revelation on celestial marriage given to Joseph Smith written on the 12th day of July, 1843. And that the teaching of Hiram Smith referred to in the minutes of the council on said 12th day of August, 1843 was on the subject of said revelation, endorsing the same and joining it to the council, joining it on the council. Okay, then we get Thomas Grover. He says oh, the same I'm thing. Sorry. I'm sorry. Can you please. go back to that one? Because I think yeah. multiple people signed off on that. David Fulmer, Thomas Grover, Aaron Johnson, and James Allred. Yeah. And attested to by Joseph, I guess, Joseph F. Smith. And then Thomas Grover, uh, he also goes with the Brighamites. He's an advocate of polygamy. And essentially all of these that are on the same sort of paper are going to come from that uh, that sect of Mormonism. But he says, again, essentially the same thing. I'll leave it here. You can pause it for a moment. Read it if you want to. Easily to read. Um, but same, same story. Aaron Johnson, same thing. He is a Brighamite. He's comfortable with polygamy. He sides with the uh, Joseph Smith's revelation. And uh, he leaves his testimony as well. He also testifies of the same story. Now, those who didn't accept the revelation, we haven't gotten to yet. We've got William Marks, Austin Cowles, and Leonard Sobey. They were in disagreement. By the way, David Fulmer is the one who tells us that. Further saith that William Marks, Austin Cowles, and Leonard Sobey were the only persons present who did not receive the revelation and testimony of Hiram Smith, and that all the others did receive it from the teaching and testimony of the said Hiram Smith. Again, I want to note if this is about dynastic ceilings or if this is about some other time period other than the restoration, it makes very little sense for three of the men to be so bothered that they raise their hand in objection to the revelation. That makes no sense. Okay. Uh, anything you guys want to say here? Otherwise I'll move on to these three and their testimonies. I understand from Brian that the reason these are all dated the, the affidavits in 1869 is because the precipitating factor in creating these affidavits was that Joseph Smith III and company from the Reorganites were coming out to Utah do, to do a little missionary work and to testify that Joseph Smith never practiced polygamy because that was, of course, one of the main identifying features of the Reorganite Church at the time, today, Community of Christ Covenant, and that these affidavits then were gathered up and maybe Joseph F. Smith who was much younger then at the time in 1869, was largely responsible for going around and gathering them. Is that correct, Brian? Yeah. In fact, Lindsay did a good episode on your polygamy with John Hamer talking about this cousin versus cousin battle. So I'll let her narrate that part. Do you want me to go into it? Or, I mean, I don't want to waste too much time. We have several affidavits over different, uh, for different reasons. One is Temple Lot case later on during the Smoot hearings. And Joseph F. Smith is Hiram's son, and his cousin Joseph Smith III is Joseph Smith's th son. And they have a, at least a 20 year battle of uh, who's telling the truth, whose mother is telling the truth. Uh, is their father a polygamist or not? And they spent much of their life um, trying to prove the other one wrong. So, uh, yeah, you can hear more about that at your polygamy. So and on the one hand, on the one hand, Bill, I would say that people who deny that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy look at this as the church leaning on or manufacturing or having other people manufacture false affidavits saying that this happened at the Nauvoo Council meeting in August 12th, 1843. Yeah. On the other hand, there has to be some kind of precipitating factor or reason for the creation of these affidavits in the first place. They would not have come into existence unless there were someone out there challenging it. So I'm not sure that that argument, it's kind of 50, 50 one way or the other. I don't know that it means anything when you consider the fact these wouldn't exist unless there had been a reason to create them. Yeah. And as we get into it, as we go forward, so everyone that I had the affidavit of from this point and prior, 
These are all folks who went with the Brighamite sect of Mormonism. They would have wanted there to be evidence that Joseph Smith was the originator of polygamy and perpetuated it. Now we're going to get into the three witnesses of that meeting, the Nauvoo Stake High Council, who were against polygamy. And you'll see in the very next one, we'll, I think we start with Leonard Sobey because the other two we get to in the Nauvoo Expositor. But with Leonard Sobey, the RLDS church is hoping they can go to him and find out exactly what the polygamy deniers, their case is, which is they're hoping that he'll say, I don't care what those other guys told you in affidavits. I was there and what they said happened did not happen, but that's not what occurs. So they go to Leonard Sobey and he leaves two affidavits. One is dated uh, November 14th, uh, 1883. Oh, maybe I just have one. Sorry, just one. Uh, no, it's our tar There is two. One in 1883 and the other is in 1886. Uh, swore an affidavit about the high council meeting. He named everyone he could remember that was there. Said Hiram Smith, after certain explanations, read the revelation on celestial marriage. Sobe also said he read the revelation as printed in the DNC and concluded, quote, to the best of my knowledge and belief, it is the same word for word as the revelation then read by Hiram Smith. And I just want to note here, he converted to Mormonism. He moved to Nauvoo. He's a member of the High Council in 1841. He heard Hiram Smith's presentation in 1843. He joined with the expositor publishers, but he remained in good standing in the church. His support of Rigdon, though, led to his removal in September of 1844. I want to note two other things. In a book, this was Religious Delusions by J.V. Coombs. He says, Leonard Sobey, a member of the High Council who had rejected the revelation and apostatized, was living in New Jersey in 1883. President Smith of the reorganized church sent to Mr. Sobey to secure his affidavit that he did not hear the revelation read. Mr. Sobey told the messenger, quote, if you will draw up an affidavit setting forth that I was there and did hear the revelation, I will sign it for you, unquote. He did sign the latter kind of a document, and Mr. Gurley, the messenger, apostatized from the reorganized church because of it. The affidavit in full appears in Mr. Bay's book. Two members of the council who accepted the doctrine heard the revelation. Two members who apostatized on account of the doctrine heard it. The testimony is sufficient, and there can be no charge of bias. Also note in, um, in Leonard Sobey's obituary, it's a sort of note of what he did. It says uh, he was one of Joseph Smith's counselors. There's a misunderstanding there. He was a counselor on the Nauvoo Stake High Council. So whoever's writing this sort of doesn't understand Mormon lingo, but, um, but was not a polygamist. And then notice the very last line. He was not a believer in plural wives. This is the perfect guy who should have said, hey, guys, I was there too, and everybody else is lying. What they said happened did not happen. And instead, he was adamant that you hold my testimony the way it was said, and it actually did happen, and Hiram Smith taught that revelation. Again, if this is dynastic ceilings or some other time, none of this makes any sense at all. Any this, thoughts I you think guys? this one thing is huge to me. If there were nothing else, I think this demonstrates the case adequately. Yeah. Can okay. I just now, one thing about uh, just the broom, man. So I, I appreciate, I really love how you've laid out these documents. And the fact that it's not just faithful Brighamites that are saying that it originated with Joseph Smith is important. Because uh, we have people like Alpheus Cutler, who was in this meeting, who goes on to practice plural marriage. And he claims that the, that the power and the authority to do so originates from Joseph Smith, not Brigham Young. He doesn't like Brigham Young. He challenges Brigham Young. We have several of these guys who break with Brigham Young. And they never say, you know what? It was Brigham Young that started this. They always trace it back to, to Joseph Smith. So it's not just Brighamites who are saying, um, yeah, it started with Joseph Smith. There are many, many people. And it, even William Law, who doesn't like polygamy at all, he'll go on for the rest of his life saying this. And I think that that was really challenging for the RLDS faction. Yeah, to the point where the person who went to procure that affidavit ends up apostatizing because it wasn't, he had to deal with the fact that 
Leonard Sobey said, no, actually, this originated with Joseph Smith. Hence, he knew the RLDS claims of authority were wrong in his mind. Zena Skirley actually tries to get Joseph Smith III to debate this in RLDS circles in the, the pages of their periodical. And Joseph Smith has, the third has to shut him down because he can see where this is going. So he's constantly having to battle these people from Nauvoo, people like Zena Skirley, people like William Marks, people like Leonard Sobey, who were there and saw it. They're adults at that point. Joseph Smith III is not. He is not in any of these meetings. So he has to keep battling these people who are there and are telling him, I was there. I don't like what happened, but I saw it. That's very yeah. difficult to combat. Yeah, very good. All right, so now we move on to the Nauvoo Expositor. I put the front page of the edition. There was only one edition printed. It was four pages long. The very uh, the front page, there's kind of an acknowledgement of uh, kind of what its mission is on this situation. It says, we are earnestly seeking to explode the vicious principles of Joseph Smith and those who practice the same abominations and whoredoms. Okay. Then we open up the Nauvoo Expositor and we get where they are giving a synopsis of what's going on. And they say on Saturday, while Mr. Foster was preparing to take his witnesses, 41 in number, to the council room, that he might make good his charges against Joseph. So there's there's this Foster gentleman who's accusing Joseph Smith of polygamy. He's got 41 witnesses who he's going to bring in. And then he finds out that they had preempted him. Here's what they said. Um, uh, make the might make good his charges against Joseph. President William Marks notified him that the trial had been on Thursday evening before the 15th and that he was cut off from the church and that same council cut off brother law, sister law and brother Smith and all their and all without their knowledge. In other words, they broke kind of church principle of letting people testify on their behalf, cut them off from the church before they could have their meeting that they had already warned them they were going to do. So that way these people would have no standing in the church to be able to have a meeting where they could take their 41 witnesses in and demonstrate that Joseph Smith was practicing polygamy. Um, let's see here. They were not notified. Neither did they dream of any such thing being done for William law had sent Joseph and some of the 12 special word that he desired an investigation before the church in general conference on the 6th of April. The court, however, was a tribunal possessing no power to try William Law, who was called by special revelation to stand as a counselor. He is a counselor in the first presidency at the time, to president of the church, Joseph, which was twice ratified by general conferences. Any thoughts on that section? I'm going to move over to the next one, if not. Okay. Well, how scurvy, to use a term my mother used, how scurvy to have the laws and Mr. Foster all ready to go with 41 witnesses to prove that Joseph Smith is practicing polygamy, only to find out right before the hearing date that, oh, guess what? You got excommunicated in a secret tribunal without your notice or participation. So Last Thursday. Yeah. So I guess we can't have your hearing after all. Yeah. And so then they've got the resolutions here. It says, uh, individual follies and iniquities of Joseph Smith, Hiram Smith, and many other official characters in the Church of Jesus Christ. And then down below, in the, in, under, uh, underlined in red, and inasmuch as they have introduced false and damnable doctrines into the church, and then it names them, and one of them is the plurality of wives for time and eternity. And then we get to these three affidavits, and we get William Law, who was a counselor in the first presidency, we get Jane Law, his wife, and then we get a counselor in the Nauvoo uh, stake presidency, Austin Cowles. So Cowles is at that uh, Nauvoo high council meeting. William Law and Jane Law are dealing with this polygamy issue uh, over the last few months, uh, actually last year. And of course, it led to the law's excommunication. So here's the affidavits. And we'll take these one at a time. I hereby certify that Hiram Smith did in his office read to me a certain written document, which he said was a revelation from God. He said that he was with Joseph when he when it, when it was received. He afterwards gave me the document to read, and I took it to my house and read it and showed it to my wife and returned it next day. The revelation so-called authorized certain men to have more wives than one at a time in this world and in the world to come. And this was the law and commanded Joseph to enter into the law. 
and also that he should administer to others. Several other items were in the revelation supporting the above doctrine, signed William Law. RFM, you noticed this. I, I didn't, but you noticed the connection of these three uh, affidavits to section 132 itself. Do you want to speak here on William Law in the next slide? Then. Okay, yeah, that would be great. Because what happens in these affidavits is that they tell us what's in this document that allegedly this revelation that they're saying that Hiram Smith showed him, right? It's basically section 132 is what they're alleging. And yet they seem to know exactly what's in section 132 because what they describe we find in section 132. Now, everybody may be saying, what's so amazing about that? Once again, this is demonstrating, or at least is certainly strong evidence in my mind, that this is not something that Brigham Young made up after the fact and then tried to pawn off on Joseph Smith after he was dead. These affidavits were published during Joseph Smith's lifetime. We know that because of the date on the one and only issue of the Nauvoo Expositor in which these affidavits appeared. So we've got William Law. Go ahead. You can go to the next one if you like. Yeah. The next slide, Bill. Verse 15, therefore, if a man marry him a wife in the world, and then at the end, therefore, they are not bound by any law when they are out of the world. So this is talking about if they're married in this life, in the world, not by the authority of God, they're not bound in the next world. And then the following paragraph, if they are bound in this life by the law, then they will be bound in the next world. It's this use of out of the world or in the world, and in the next world they will be married, that finds a parallel in what William Law says, because he says, the revelation, so-called, authorized certain men to have more wives than one at a time in this world and in the world to come. It's like, it, what we have to do is we have to understand and account for why it is that William Law knows the language that's in section 132 if indeed it wasn't created until after Joseph Smith was dead, because apparently it wasn't. By the way, there's something else that sticks out there where he emphasizes in italics the word the law. It said this was the law and commanded Joseph to enter into the law. And you find right there in verse 4 of section 132, no, verse 3, Therefore, prepare thy heart to receive and obey the instructions which I am about to give unto you. For all those who have this law revealed unto them must obey the same. So he's using even the same language that we find in section 132 from verses 15 and 16 and also from verse 3, just in that one affidavit. Then there's the next part. And I'm not sure what, which one this is referring to. If this is Jane Austen, Jane Austen, if it's Jane Law. Mm-hmm. But can you go to the next slide so I'll yeah, know? Yeah, so this, yeah, so Jane, yep, so I was going to read Jane Law's first. Let me do that. Okay. I certify that I, this is Jane Law, William Law's wife talking. She says, I certify that I read the revelation referred to in the above affidavit of my husband. It's sustained in strong terms, the doctrine of more wives than one at a time in this world. In the next, it authorized some to have to the number of 10 and set forth that those women who would not allow their husbands to have more wives than one should be under condemnation before God. And then we get section 132 again. What she's describing appears to be the law of Sarah, as it's come to be known. And this is at the end or toward the end of section 132. It has 66 verses once again. What it appears that she's referring to is verses 52 through 54. And yeah. can we get, Lindsay, could you read this? Verses 52 through 54. Sure. And let mine handmaid, Emma Smith, receive all those that have been given unto my servant Joseph and who are virtuous and pure before me. And those who are not pure and have said that they were pure shall be destroyed, saith the Lord God. For I am the Lord thy God, and ye shall obey my voice. And I give, my, I give unto my servant Joseph that he shall be made ruler over many things. For he hath been faithful over a few things, and from henceforth I will strengthen him. 
And I command my handmaid, Emma Smith, to abide and cleave unto my servant Joseph and to none else. But if she will not abide this commandment, she shall be destroyed, saith the Lord. For I am the Lord thy God and will destroy her if she abide not in my law. So if you go back to the Jane Law affidavit, brief though it is, and set forth that those women who would not allow their husbands to have more wives than one should be under condemnation before God. Okay? So how is it that Jane seems to know what's at the end of section 132 and her husband, who also says he read the same revelation, knows what's at the beginning and in the middle of section 132? If indeed they were not shown what is equivalent to section 132 in our Doctrine and Covenants today. I just found another, by the way, Jane Law mentions that it's okay up to the number of 10. And I just want to note that Doctrine and Covenants 132 verses 62 and 63 say the very thing that she just said, which is that it could be up to the number of 10 and that would be okay. There's no question in my mind that Jane Law and William Law saw a revelation that in material respects is identical to the one that we have in section 132. I got to say, RFM, I hope you write us on some paper on this or something. I think this is really, really strong evidence and, and something that I don't think people have talked about before. So I think it's a really good find. And back to what I said earlier, where there's this large argument that Joseph Smith was, because he was so famous and he, because he brought forth the truth, he was persecuted and lied about. And you guys are public figures. We know how this goes. People make stuff up about us sometimes. People lie. They say things. Um I'm sure that happened to Joseph Smith, and it did sometimes, but by strangers who had never met him. These are Joseph Smith's closest friends over and over and over again, his closest associates who have this damning evidence. It's not just some rando reporter all the way in fancy schmancy New York writing these things. This, These are people who spent many, many hours with Joseph Smith in very intimate ways. Yeah. And so now we go to the last one, which is Austin Cowles from the Nauvoo uh, Stake uh, High Council uh, meeting. For as much as the public mind has been much agitated by course of procedure in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, by a number of persons declaring against certain doctrines and practices therein, among whom I am one, it is but meet that I should give my reasons, at least in part, as a cause that hath led me to declare myself. In the latter part of the summer of 1843, the patriarch Hiram Smith did, in the high council of which I was a member, introduce what he said was a revelation given through the prophet that the said Hiram Smith did uh, essay to, um, I guess that says essay, essay to read said revelation in the said council that according to his reading, there was contained the following doctrines. First, the sealing up of persons to eternal life against all sins, save that of shedding innocent blood or consenting thereto. Can you and stop there for just a second? Yes. Because that's verse 26 of the DNC. In section 132. 26 and 27 there on the left-hand side. <coughs> yes, and that's where it talks about being sealed up to eternal life and that once you're sealed up, you cannot fall unless you deny the Holy Ghost or shed innocent blood. Yep. And then he says the second one, the second doctrine, um, I got to find it here. First, second, the doctrine of plurality of wives or marrying virgins that David and Solomon had many wives yet in this, they sinned not save in the matter of Uriah. This revelation with other evidence that the aforementioned heresies were taught and practiced in the church determined me to leave the office of first counselor to the president of the church at Nauvoo inasmuch as I dared not teach and administer such laws and further deponent uh, depon uh, said not Austin Cowles. That second doctrine is verses 38 and 39 of section 132. So let me see if I got this right. The witnesses who are William Clayton, who you could maybe posit that he has motive to alter things, but the other four um, do not, and we'll get to Mark's here in a moment. 
By the way, uh, Austin Cowles leaves a contemporary uh, affidavit in the Nauvoo Expositor. It's not just after the fact. This was written during Joseph Smith's lifetime. He also identifies virgins as being those who are able to be married by polygamy, pluralized virgins. And that's something we find in section 132 as well. It speaks in terms of virgins only. So William Clayton, William Law, Jane Law, and Austin Cowles in contemporary sources quote or refer to section uh, DNC 132 verses one through four, verse 15, Verses 26 and 27, 38 and 39, 52 and 54, and 62 and 63. That's pretty dang significant. From the beginning, the end, and all the way through. Yes. They saw this document. They saw section 132, or what was substantially similar to what we have as section 132 today, including all of those points that they said they saw, and that they signed an affidavit to that effect, which was published in June before Joseph Smith died. You have several people arguing that there was a revelation from Joseph Smith with some of the wording because this was a divine principle. You have people who said that Joseph Smith had a revelation and they knew some of the content, but it was because he was a fallen prophet. Sounds to me like there was a revelation from Joseph Smith and that he was a polygamist. Yeah. Pretty hard to argue any other way out of that one. And, and the only way you can come to an understanding that that everybody is in angst, everybody's disagreeing with each other, people are leaving the church, people are losing their faith. You can't explain this away as dynastic ceilings, and you can't explain this away as Joseph just giving a revelation on uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That that just makes zero sense. And so for the folks who push this narrative, or the folks who are believing it when it's pushed on you, please recognize that the evidence is overwhelming and we're not even done. Okay, um, Nauvoo City High Council minutes, because the only argument here could be, you know, there's some mass conspiracy and Hiram's not there and people are putting words in his mouth or Joseph doesn't, you know, Hiram's going off on his own rogue and Joseph disagrees with Hiram. Um, but what we end up with is the Nauvoo High Council um, is doing this thing where uh, Hiram is reading the Revelation and then uh, just under a year later, it's at the point here where shit is really hitting the fan, um, and now there becomes the Nauvoo High uh, sit. I'm sorry, the Nauvoo City Council minutes, and I want to read this. It's a little long, but it, it kind of blends these two events together so you understand them. When the High Council assembled in Hiram Smith's office on the 12th of August, 1843, talk of the prophet's plural marriages were was unavoidable. Counselor Austin Cowles, 29 year old daughter, had married. Smith the previous June. One of Counselor David Fulmer's sister had married him a month later. Counselor George H. Uh, George W. Harris's own wife had married the prophet. Counselor William D. Huntington had taken a plural wife in February 1843 and knew that two of his sisters had married Smith in 1841. Lewis Dunbar Wilson announced that he was satisfied that there was something in those rumors and he wanted to know about it. Immediately, Hiram Smith, who would take his first plural wife's before the end of the month, excused himself, walked across the street to his house, and retrieved the surviving copy of his brother's revelation. This is the Kingsbury copy, because the other one had been destroyed by Emma. Um, which he read to the council and bore testimony to its truth. Hiram reasoned upon the revelation for about an hour, remembered Thomas Grover, and we saw that earlier, clearly explaining the same, and then enjoined it upon the council to receive and acknowledge the same, or they would be damned. There's no reason to be damned over dynastic ceilings or past teachings of the past, right? A majority of counselors agreed and assented, testified Leonard Sobey, believing it to be of celestial order, though no vote was taken upon it for the reason that the voice of the prophet in such matters was understood by us to the voice of God to the church. And that said revelation was presented to said council as before stated as coming from Joseph Smith, the prophet of the Lord, and was received by us as other revelations had been. The council's official minutes record simply, no business before the council, teaching by President Hiram Smith and William Marks. We saw that earlier. Only Cowles, Sobey, and William Marks would ultimately reject the prophet's doctrine. James Allred, Samuel Bent, Elpheus Cutler, 
Fulmer, Grover, Huntington, Aaron Johnson, and Wilson would all marry plurally prior to the Saints' exodus west. Fearing recrimination, both Joseph and Hiram went publicly, would publicly assert the following June that the revelation referred to ancient and former days and had nothing to do with present time. So now, a year later, the Nauvoo City Council meets because the Nauvoo Expositor has been published. And uh, I'll read this here. The only issue of the Nauvoo Expositor published on June 7th was a four-page publication. According to William Law, Smith had made several proposals to Law's wife, Jane, under the premise that Jane Law would enter a polyandrous marriage with Smith. Law's wife, Jane, later described Smith's proposals, saying that Smith had, quote, asked her to give him half her love. She was at liberty to keep the other half for her husband, unquote. On January 8th, 1844, one day after the Nauvoo Expositor had been published, Smith removed Law from the first presidency. On April 18th, 1844, Law and his wife were excommunicated from the church, along with his brother Wilson Law, Brigadier General in the Nauvoo Legion. Also excommunicated were Robert Foster and Howard Smith. The publishers of the Expositor were William Law, his brother, Brigadier General Wilson Law of the Nauvoo Legion, Charles Ivins, Colonel Francis Higby, his brother Chauncey Higby, brothers Robert and Charles Foster, and the editor was Sylvester Emmons, a non-Mormon member of the Nauvoo City Council. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead here. Bill, Go ahead. did you want to focus on the last line about what Joseph and Hiram said about the revelation in the Nauvoo City Council meeting? I do, but I want to do it in the t context of the newspaper that reports on it. Okay, very good. So this is the Nauvoo neighbor. This is a not a it's not a church authorized newspaper, but it is published with the editor being John Taylor. And Taylor certainly isn't doing something the church doesn't want him to do. He's he's fine doing it. It's just not official official newspaper of the church. He's doing it on his own. And in this edition of the newspaper, this is a few days later after the Nauvoo Expositor is published. And the next day, Joseph Smith calls an emergency meeting of the city council. And uh, they take the 8th. I think it's June, isn't it? I just want to make sure I get that right. It's June. By the yeah. way, it's June 7th today. Today is National Nauvoo Expositor Day. Yeah. And by the way, William I'm Law was... I'm celebrating. Look at that. That's, quite, that's pretty cool. Yeah. What a what a kind what a that's karma. I love this. Um, I, I I did say one thing wrong. William Law and his wife and the others were excommunicated on January eighth, eighteen forty four. So then on June seventh, they published the Nauvoo Expositor. Today. Do you Beautiful. say January eighth? January eighth, eighteen forty four. So they were excommunicated a few months ago before this all happened. And uh, the Nauvoo Expositor is published on the 7th of June today. Anniversary, love it. Didn't plan that. And uh, the next day, Joseph Smith has an emergency meeting, and then they also re uh, reconvene the meeting on the 10th. And on the 10th, they decide that the Nauvoo Expositor is a public nuisance, and then they go out and destroy it. And I'll just say here the – I want to make sure I get this right um, – Joseph Smith called an emergency city council meeting on June 8th, where he, quote, proceeded to put the expositor and its editors on trial as if that body was a judicial instead of legislative character, unquote. The trial lasted all of Saturday, June 8th and part of Monday, June 10th, where the expositor was declared a public nuisance and Smith issued two orders for the expositor's destruction. City Marshal John P. Green, accompanied by a posse of several hundred and carried out the destruction. The members of the Nauvoo Municipal Government were Mayor Joseph Smith, Councillor Hiram Smith, Councillor John Taylor, Councillor Sylvester Emmons, Councillor Johnson, Councillor Benjamin Warrington, Councillor Hunter, Alderman Bennett, and Alderman Smith. And uh, the Nauvoo neighbor uh, was only published between 1843 and 1845, but it is reporting on the city uh, council minutes. And so I put the, the red section there as the pertinent section. So I've got all of that on the left. And then there are there's a really important part of it, which the first red line, which is in the third column towards the bottom, this is Councillor Hiram Smith continued. 
And then Hiram talks about uh, this Jackson guy for a minute. And then it says, and this is Hiram Smith, referred to the revelation read in the high council of the church, which has caused so much talk about the multiplicity of wives. That said revelation was an answer to question concerning things which transpired in former days and had no reference to the present time. So here we are a year after the Nauvoo High Council where Hiram reads the revelation and everybody's up in arms. And now they're trying to retrofit a new interpretation to it so they can calm everybody down. And their interpretation is that it refers to the past and not right now. But here's the cool thing. If this was dynastic ceilings, then that doesn't work. The only that only works when you're trying to explain away sexual polygamy. So they actually showed their cards here because this is the perfect moment for Joseph and Hiram to stand up and go, you guys confused all of this, that we were never doing modern polygamy. I, I, we were just doing dynastic ceilings. We were just trying to uh, seal people in, in uh, sibling relationships so they could be together forever but he doesn't. He says it has to do with the past. And so all of you folks who come up with your reasons for what's going on, this doesn't fit. The best explanation for this is that they are trying to walk away from polygamy because it has finally gotten to the point where they can see they're not going to be able to do this without a ton of contention. Um, and I don't see any other interpretation unless you buy into that it actually is for the past, which makes no sense in light of all the other evidence that's been shared tonight. Great point. And additionally, in this contemporary document, by the way, I'm going to want to know what the date of this Nauvoo neighbor issue was, Bill. Mm -hmm. But what they have is a, it's documented here in the newspaper that Hiram at the Nauvoo City Council meeting on June 8th, I think this is June 14th. So June 14th. So they're still alive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hiram and Joseph are still alive. And in this newspaper, it has Hiram Smith admitting to the revelations existence that Hiram read it to the high council of the church back on August 12th of 1843. And that it talks about a multiplicity of wives. So they're giving away the farm here in order to make this lame excuse that the revelation was an answer to a question concerning things which transpired in former days and had no reference to the present time. To get to that point, they have to admit everything else leading up to it. And I will suggest to you that if really all it had to do with was things that transpired in former times, it wouldn't have been secret. It wouldn't have caused all the fury, all the commotion, all the controversy, all the deeded property to Emma, everything that we've talked about. This is obviously, to me at least, an ad hoc excuse to try and make it so this revelation is not as combustible and controversial as it obviously was. And what they're saying is, oh, I guess uh, Jane Law and William Law and Austin Cowles and all these people who wrote their affidavits in the Nauvoo Expositor, they just misunderstood. It's also important to remember this is a public forum. And that's something that will be trotted out frequently as well. Joseph Smith frequently denied things in public. Great. Don't really care. Pro tip. If you'd like to understand how Mormon polygamy works, public statements by Mormon church leaders, not helpful unless you want to flip them around. This will apply from here all the way up beyond the second manifesto uh, a long time from now. Anything else from you guys on this? So I'm going to tap into the call-in studio. Um, we generally take a few phone calls at the end. Uh, I just want to note uh, that we get to the end here. All I've got left is William Marks himself. And William Marks is sort of ambiguous, but not when you understand the context of everything that's been happening in terms of the Nauvoo High Council, the Nauvoo Expositor, and the Nauvoo City Council Minutes. 
So William Marks says, when the doctrine of polygamy was introduced into the church as a principle of exaltation, I took a decided stand against it, which stand rendered me quite unpopular with many of the leading ones in the church. Joseph, however, became convinced before his death that he had done wrong. For about three weeks before his death, I met him one morning in the street, and he said to me, Brother Marks, we are a ruined people. I asked, how so? He said, the doctrine of polygamy or spiritual wife system that has been taught and practiced among us will prove our destruction and overthrow. I have been deceived, said he. In reference to its practice, it is wrong. It is a curse to mankind, and we shall have to leave the United States soon unless it can be put down and its practice stopped in the church. Now, said he, Brother Marks, you have not received this doctrine, and how glad I am. I want you to go into the high council, and I will have charges preferred against all who practice this doctrine, and I want you to try them by the laws of the church and cut them off if they will not repent and cease the practice of this doctrine. RFM, your thoughts on this quote? I think it's quite compelling because William Marks was against polygamy. And yet, in order to get to the point which he's laboring toward, which is that Joseph Smith came to him and told him, oh, I, I made this huge mistake. What does he say? That he had done wrong. In order to get to the point of Joseph Smith being repentant, William Marks has to acknowledge that Joseph Smith had made a mistake, which seems quite apparent from reading the document, that that mistake was instituting and practicing and teaching polygamy. Yeah. Uh, any thoughts from Lindsay or Brian? The only, th oh, go ahead, please. Yeah. I was just going to say, I, I think over and over again, I think the thing that this whole story talks about is what I talked about at the, at the beginning. This is not just a doctrine about sex. It's about power. And you can see how it affects all of the men in power. That's how we know it's about power. All of these men who held prominent positions, if they contest in or they obey, uh, shows how much power they get. And it really, you know, women become this bargaining chip uh, on earth and in heaven. And again, that's why I think it's a system of power. And that's why I think these men were responding to it. It wasn't just like, oh, you know, people are having sex because we know even I think one of the Higbees, right, Brian, uh, that wrote the Navu Expositor was excommunicated for adultery at some point. There was a whole adultery thing going on. It wasn't just about that. It was about how this gave men power in the kingdom of God. And I think um, this is a, just another example of that. And just underscoring that this is not somebody who followed Brigham Young, who had some kind of motive to say Joseph Smith's practice polygamy. Of course, he wouldn't be saying if he were aligned with Brigham Young that he said it was a mistake. But this is the person who would have the motive to say, because he aligned himself with Emma after Joseph Smith died in the anti-polygamy faction. His motivation, if he's making all of this up, is to say Joseph Smith never practiced polygamy. But he doesn't say that. He, sees, he seems to say Joseph Smith did and then said, oops, I've made a mistake because now everything's on the table and it looks like we're facing destruction. And for Joseph Smith, it ended up being true, which William Marsh certainly knew by the time he wrote this in 1853. And I'll just add, this is the perfect opportunity for Marx to say what you just said, RFM, to say that this didn't originate with Joseph. This was Brigham Young because Emma sort of wants to kind of hold that, right? Um, but instead, what he does is in the very first uh, top part, he indicates that this is it, sort of ambiguous, but he indicates the best understanding here is that this came through the official channels of the church. When the doctrine of polygamy was introduced into the church as a principle of exaltation, I took a decided stand against it, which stand rendered me quite unpopular with many of the leading ones in the church. Notice he is sort of wanting intentionally to avoid naming Joseph Smith. Then he admits that Joseph Smith had done wrong, and we can argue about what that wrong was, but notice the word he uses in the bottom section, doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. If a few stray members are practicing something without the church's approval, it sure as hell isn't doctrine. Doctrine, doctrine, doctrine. Right, and this would have been the time he would have said it. Once again, it. like you said, Bill, we look at what he didn't say, and what he would have said if this is something that he's just writing because of his own motivations to exonerate Joseph Smith from the practice of polygamy, this doesn't do it. This inculpates Joseph Smith. 
in its practice. Yeah. Can I say one more thing about people that followed Emma who uh, like Marx? Because I think from a modern perspective, at least in the 1970s, when a lot of these polygamy denier arguments come out, thanks to the RLDS Price family who starts publishing this, they sort of paint this as when the church breaks up, it's between Brigham Young, who chooses polygamy, and everyone else that knows that Joseph didn't. And anyone that followed uh, Emma Smith knew that Brigham, or sorry, that Joseph wasn't a polygamist. William Smith, Joseph Smith's own brother, ends up following Emma Smith. He was a polygamist. He was in trouble in Boston when Joseph Smith was still alive for practicing spiritual wifery and getting in trouble by his own brother. So there are other motives for people to follow Emma after the church, even though they knew Joseph Smith was a polygamist. William Smith's motive, I think, had to do with the fact that he believed that the church belonged to the Smith family. And so he was willing to compromise uh, that doctrine so it could go into ownership of the church. And I think Marx is a good example of that, too. So when we look at people that join Emma, they're not all polygamy deniers who join Emma. A lot of them, like Marx, knew and witnessed it, and some polygamists even join Emma's church and then they, you know, eventually give it up after. So it's not, it wasn't like a choice between did he or didn't he? A lot of people knew it. Marx yeah. is particularly problematic and we've got a good, our good friend John Dinger is working on a book on Marx because he is such a compelling character. And it's interesting that the RLDS position on this issue hardens only after a few of these guys like Marx pass away and Joseph Smith III no longer has living witnesses to how Nauvoo actually happened, that he can he can harden his position that Joseph Smith was not involved in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. So I wanted to put in kind of an image so that folks could see the 20,000-foot view. Um, I don't want this image to be confusing. I am a little worried about that. But what I did was I took every one of the sources that we talked about at tonight. I put Joseph Smith at the center. I've got, uh, you know, section 101, Oliver Cowdery's letter about Fanny Alger, the happiness letter, John C. Bennett, Martha Brotherton, any source that was of evidence that we use tonight and how it connected to other pieces. At the very bottom, the dark blue circle is Brigham Young. Brigham Young has some effect on about half of the affidavits regarding the Nauvoo High Council. He might be able to affect the Nauvoo neighbor newspaper but he also doesn't have an effect with about half of the affidavits. He also has an effect on the Clayton diaries. And if we're going to suggest, which I think is highly probable after tonight's episode, that the section 132 we have today was not what was recorded originally, um, you could argue that Brigham had effect over that to some degree. Every other piece of evidence that we shared tonight, the Lucy Walker marriage, the Emma Smith land deed, the Nauvoo expositor, uh, with the three affidavits, all of the women's land deeds in Nauvoo, the Melissa Lott Bible marriage, the Martha Brotherton letter, the John C. Bennett book, the happiness letter, the Oliver Cowdery letter, and section 101, and some of the things regarding uh, Hiram Smith, have no connection to Brigham Young. And, and so what you end up with here is a preponderance of evidence all around. Some of it is extremely solid. Some of it might be a little iffy. When you look at the overall view of the 20,000 foot view, you see that Joseph Smith, the patterns that he enacted on these women and in with parents of, of children in order to procure these relationships, when you look at uh, the data that's being shown, there's a consistent story going on where Joseph Smith is the author and perpetuator of polygamy. And that polygamy was not dynastic ceilings. And that polygamy did not have to do with former times and not the modern moment. And you can see that from the council minutes, the city council minutes um, juxtaposed against the other data. And so I'm, I wanna finish off just saying that, again, I, I started off this episode saying I wanted to speak to two groups. And my hope is if we're gonna be rational thinkers, if we're gonna go with what is what is by far most likely, the folks who have struggled with polygamy and Somewhere in your mind, you've tried to not have it fall at the feet of Joseph Smith, but instead fall at the feet of Brigham Young or someone else or some other interpretation. Unfortunately, you're going to have to sit with polygamy being Joseph Smith's product. 
And that may mean lots of things for you. Unfortunately, that's the story you're going to have to sit with because that's where the evidence goes in a significant, strong manner. And for the folks who are pushing this narrative, I'm hoping after tonight's episode, you can sense that you're heading down a road that isn't rational, that isn't the best narrative backed by the evidence. And my two cents is you're going to have to stop pushing this narrative because what you're doing is you're giving people a false hope that isn't that isn't rational and it isn't uh, evidence-based. Um, and that's my two cents. And unfortunately, in Mormonism, there is messy and complex things that are hard to deal with. And, and we've all had to wrestle a little bit uh, with polygamy, among a thousand other things. I also think it's important to point out that our, our purpose here tonight is not to argue that polygamy is divine or not. Our purpose here is not to argue for LDS church truth claims or not, or any other truth claims or not. The goal here is to point out what is good history, using the principles that we use to determine every other sort of history, not just polygamy, and that the rules that we, we hold to and, and, and look to in other areas have to be applied here as well. That's it, that's our only goal. I, can I say something as my closing mm -hmm. thoughts? Mm -hmm. uh, because I did a, a podcast dedicated to polygamy, I've sometimes been the target of, you know, some of the really anti-polygamy denier, the deni polygamy denier folks. And I've really tried to keep an open mind because of the ardent nature that they believe this. And with all of my guests, I try to take their beliefs as seriously as they do. And, and my brand with Sunstone is there's more than one way to Mormon. We can all engage this at different you know, experiences. But every time, every single time I've tried to earnestly and thoughtfully engage this with polygamy deniers, uh, the, uh, the evidence soon turns into something that it is absolutely faith-based or magical or has to do with aliens or gods or like stuff that I cannot argue with with the data and with the documentation. And like Brian said, I don't care if you believe Joseph Smith is a prophet of God or not. I don't. That's your business. The business that I care about is good history, is telling the most accurate history. And I get resentful when uh, people can't engage that and you know, turn it into personal attacks about how I look, how I talk, how I act. And I know, and I've seen it happen to you guys too. And that's when I know that it's not a tenable position. And so I, I would just remind people of that because at the end of the day, we didn't even bring this up, but this is something that really bothers me. When presented with all of this evidence that hist good historians have been working hard to, who have risked their careers to prove uh, people will say, well, then all Clayton's diaries are forgeries. That's a big, that's a big theory. And as Brian and I point out over and over, it can't go both ways. Polygamy deniers will pull all kinds of stuff that we get from Clayton's diaries, except for this. And then all of a sudden it's a forgery. And so it's those, those arguments that lack integrity that I want our whole community to be better at. We're looking for good history. This isn't about faith politics for me. I don't care what you believe God did or didn't do but we're talking about what we can prove with the documentation and that matters to everyone in, in our community. Yeah. Anything else, RFM? Really good. I just want to observe that, of course, we all know that the church's official position is that Joseph Smith did practice polygamy. And once again, here at Mormonism Live, we're defending the LDS church. Yeah, look at that. Yeah. Awesome. Um, all right. We've got a few phone calls. Folks, you can call in. Uh, the number, I believe, is 662-667-6667. And uh, you can also, if you've got uh, the letters on your phone, it would also work as 662 Mormons with an S on the end. Uh, we've got three calls in the call bank, so I'll take these three. And then we've gone long, so I'll end the show after that. Um, I think our first caller is going to be Patricia. Patricia, are you there? I am. Yeah, go ahead, my friend. Glad you're on the show. Hi. Um, so I kind of want to look at this a slightly different way. And I think Lindsay talked about this at the beginning a little bit about power, but I'm looking at, at it from a mis misogyny. And to think about how our past and our present are kind of tied together. Um, and it makes me wonder about how 
our culture today, both in our country and in our religion, could be traced back to something like the ability that to um, hurt women, to um, step on women. And my wonder is, like, how can we, outside of our religion, like, how can we make a change? And why something like polygamy, how does that matter in our world today outside of religion? Any thoughts from you guys? I can take that one if you want. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate that, Patricia, because that's, you know, what I've devoted sort of my life's work to. Because if you've been a woman in the church, the LDS church like I have, these patterns present themselves over and over and over again. And I, and I think like even the fact that, you know, I come from a culture that's extremely passive aggressive, especially with women. And then women are considered nagging and gossipy and all of these things. These, this stems from women not being able to ask for their own needs. And that's a huge issue in the culture that I am in to say what I want, to say what I think, to say, you know, my opinion. And you can trace in the history over and over, sermon after sermon of men telling women, we don't care what you think. Stop arguing with us. Be compliant. Be obedient. And that's just one of hundreds of ways that polygamy has infiltrated the, the modern culture today and affected us. And it's that misogyny that, that you're talking about that I think that, that really affects us. I think if you look at the history of polygamy in the LDS church, women have always been the pawns for power of men. Uh, when we talk about suffrage, there's a good feminist argument that, you know, polygamy got women the vote. People don't realize that polygamy is responsible for that. But when you look at it deep down, women become pawns for the government and for the church. I mean, it's that's how it's been. And so I think it's not just unpacking the doctrine of polygamy. Did Joseph practice it or not? It starts with an acknowledging that he did and and how the denial of it and the erasure of it affects how we view women and sex today. But I also think it, it shows the LDS church is completely sex obsessed. I like that sounds like a weird thing to say, but our <laughs> doctrine is focused around uh, creation, procreation and family and then uh, women's bodies and all of that. And so when we're arguing about it as polygamy, as just a sexual thing, we're reinforcing that we have to look at it in structures of power. Yeah. When you say the, yeah, LDS I, fact, I think oh, it's, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah. No, I was just wondering, like, because I completely agree with everything you're saying. And I wonder how far back the misogyny has, has happened. And especially in our country, I had an interesting experience today. I teach high school and um, we were doing a would you rather question. And the question ended up actually asking, like, to save yourself, would you be willing to hurt other people or would you be willing to hurt yourself to save yourself? And almost to a T, I had all the boys saying they would hurt other people and all the girls saying they would hurt themselves to save themselves. Mm. Mm. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you, Patricia. So I just, uh, yeah, it was really interesting to tie that to like the massage that we have in our country. So yeah. thank you. Head on to the next person. Okay, have a great day. Bye-bye. Right, all right. Um, auto screen. Let's see here. All right. What's the name? Oh, sorry. I'm Trevor. Trevor. Awesome. Glad you're on Mormonism Live. Go ahead. You've got the panel in front of you after a really, I think, exceptional episode. What uh, What's on your mind? It's been great. It's been heavy, but it's been great. Well, I'm calling in kind of antagonistically, but I will. I will try to be. I will try to have tact. Let's say that. There is a chatter in the live chat name of Peter who has been talking a lot of smack saying that the there's a difference between marriage between time here on earth and eternity and he is too chicken to call in. So I wanted to know what your guys' thoughts on that were. Trevor, can I ask you a couple of questions? Absolutely. So does an eternal only ceiling explain all the need for secrecy? In other words, if you're doing eternal only ceilings, it doesn't seem like it's a big deal at all. Right. 
Is there a need for secrecy? Absolutely not. Yeah. And no, if, I, I feel if, oh, sorry. That's okay. And also, if it's eternal only ceilings, does that explain Hiram Smith at a meeting that Joseph Smith is present for at the Nauvoo City Council? explaining that the revelation caused a bunch of stress, but it was actually only having to do with the past. No, there would be no need to have any kind of conflict with that. No. And so on a, as a, on a rational basis, I simply point out that Peter's point of view is not only less rational, it's an irrational perspective. It also sort of becomes this knee-jerk yeah. response to any time a person who doesn't want to believe Joseph Smith practiced polygamy, when they're presented with evidence, then they can immediately go to, oh, well, it must have been only for eternity and not for time. So they're not having sex now. Sorry, Lindsay. That's usually what it focuses on, right? They're not having sex now. They're just going to have sex in the, in the far distant after death future. So it's okay. But I'm not an expert on the times it was done for this life versus for eternity. But I think that that is, it's almost like when a prophet says something that doesn't end up being correct or coming to pass. And we have this knee jerk reaction. Oh, he was speaking as a man. That's how I view this idea about talking about for eternity versus for this life. Yeah. This is stuff that was very controversial. It was very hush hush. And it was very much happening in the here and now. So I think that's, I don't know, I think it's kind of a, um, I was going to say a wood tool. I'm not sure I'm using it correctly here. Mm -hmm. But I just think it's something you just throw at something. It's, it's, it's intended to be a panacea to take care of the problem so we don't have to think about it anymore. Can also, I answer this too? Oh, please. please. Uh, yeah, this one is really important to me. So this idea of time or eternity, first of all, it didn't originate with Brigham Young. This is something that, that we see in the contemporary journals all the time. T and E, that's a code that happens. And I think someone who doesn't see uh, a distinction uh, or like doesn't see how similar those two are uh, is probably not willing to acknowledge um, how sex obsessed this argument is. And that's why I appreciate you, RFM, for bringing up the sex part, because that's what it comes down to, right? We're really arguing as Mormons if if he had sex with a woman or not. And I always think of Helen Mark Kimball. Let's just take sex out of it. She's 14 years old. There's a huge debate in the historical community. Did Joseph Smith sleep with his 14-year-old wife? Did he or did he not? Uh, to me, that is less relevant than what it did to her for the rest of her life. At 14, it chained her autonomy. She resented it. She couldn't go to dances. She couldn't socialize with her friends. She was set apart. She writes about this. It, it harms her. Even as she goes into Frontier, Utah, as a faithful daughter of a church leader, she resents polygamy the rest of her life. She talks about it often. She suffers from years of debilitating depression. And I ask you, does it matter if Joseph Smith just got to go in bed with her? Like, does her whole life experience and how she experienced that and how it limited her power, her choices, her autonomy, her self-esteem, does that not matter to people? And it doesn't. Because all we care about is, was Joseph Smith fooling around with other women? We don't care about what the system does to people. And let's let's take on the eternity, eternity argument. Oh, it's just for eternity. Do you understand what it's like to be a woman who grows up knowing that someday I might have to li live polygamy in attorney? Someday I might have to share my husband. I have to go through all of this nonsense in this life. I have to go through all of these trials with him. But someday, I don't know, he just decides he gets to bring on someone else. Anyone that brings up that argument has never had to contend with that pain and what that does. It doesn't just hurt my feelings. It altered my behavior. It altered every time. And I'm not joking. Every time I made a meal for my family, I had to in the back of my head go, is this good enough? Because if it's not, someday I could be replaced. And that was reinforced over and over and over again with this doctrine. And so when people are like, oh, it doesn't matter. It's just eternity. Okay. That's not good either. 
Yeah. Right. And, and can I just add to that, Lindsay, which is, you're right. Take sex completely out. Were, were the Lawrence sisters abused? Were, was Lucy Walker abused? Was Helen Mark Kimball abused? Were the Partridge sisters abused? Was Melissa Lott and the trade-off abused? And sure as hell, wasn't Emma abused? And you don't need sex at all for any of that. And so you still have to deal with, again, in the Lucy Walker situation, you have to choose between uh, two things which are both horrible. You either have to deal with a prophet who takes a father-daughter relationship in the case of Lucy Walker and turns it into some form of a husband-wife relationship at with manipulation and predatory behavior, or you have to accept that God's behind it and God told him to do that, which then makes God guilty of doing that very thing of changing a father-daughter relationship with manipulation and predatory behavior into a dynamic of a husband and wife relationship. And either one of those for Joseph Smith or for Joseph Smith, God is a lose-lose. Can I quickly put sex back in it for just a second here? Please, you, Spencer W. Kimball, you. So tonight we talked mainly about the first two waves of evidence. We talked about contemporary evidence, and we talked about the affidavit era, 1869 or so. The other one that we didn't really talk about, which is very important, Lindsay alluded to it a couple of times, is the Temple Lock case, in which many of these women are, under oath, asked, very pointed questions by lawyers as pointed as you could get in the in the victorian era about the sexual component of those marriages and again in as pointed as they could be in the victorian era they said yes so if someone again wants to deny that that was part of it they have to say that all of these women were lying and they were not doing that on among a mormon crowd where being a wife of Joseph Smith, with whatever that might entail, would be a positive thing. This is on this is a road game, basically. So the fact that they were willing to admit that also mitigates against that. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have one more caller, and it's actually the thing that uh, I kind of hope would come up because it is the one twist in all of this story that I think all of us have to stretch ourselves just a little bit. Uh, Mike is on the phone. Mike, are you there? Uh, yeah. Okay. Go ahead, my friend. Uh, yeah. Thanks for taking my call. Um, I did join a little late. So I apologize if you've already covered this in the episode, but, um, I find it interesting that we don't seem to have babies born from Joseph's polygamous marriages. Now, I'm aware of, I think, Josephine, the daughter of Sylvie Sessions Lyon. She thought that was maybe Joseph's daughter. Turned out to not be Joseph's daughter. Um, but I'm really curious what the panel thinks about the lack of babies from his uh, marriages. Yeah. Can I go first? Please. I'm going to try and learn from Lindsay here. Because I think that goes right back to sex. That's all I'm saying. Lindsay, what do you have to say? Well, I have a lot to say on this. I mean, it's Hugo Perego has done a lot of work on the DNA and he's published a few essays that are really important he's, and he's followed it. And up until this point, uh, they have not been able to track, you know, the, the DNA in any of the descendants. That said, uh, if you talk to any forensic genealogist, we are still developing new technology. So I wouldn't say the case is closed on that. So let's put the DNA thing away for a minute. Um, I'm sorry, but has anyone ever been on Tinder or like Ashley Madison? Is everyone, is every man that's ever been married having babies every time he steps out of his marriage? I don't think so. Is every Republican that's busted for having an affair having babies as evidence? We, we treat the 19th century like it's that separated from us. They had technology. Abortions have always existed. And we know from Patty Sessions and other midwives and John C. Bennett that they had the medicine to allow women to have abortions. They didn't have the morality around it that is so fraught in American politics. Sometimes it had to do with women's lives. Other times it had to do with secrecy. And there was contraceptives in the 19th century and men that stepped out were very familiar with those. So then we have to look at this. If we know that abortions and contraceptives were happening, women did know how to control their pregnancies. It's not like they were cattle back then and just didn't know all the time. The reason why 
people had so many babies is because they needed them. There was a necessity for it. Not all women were just stupid, aimless women who just whatever happens, happens. People were strategic about family planning, even more so because they had to feed these mouths. So we got to stop treating 19th century people like stupid yokels who didn't know what the consequences of sex were. They knew and they paid very close attention to it. And so that aside, Joseph Smith had a lot to lose if babies came out from his his unions. They would have been direct evidence. And I, and I don't just mean indictments of his sexual morality. It would have become a legal issue, a property issue. And Joseph Smith had a terrible rate of fertility. You look at his own uh, children. His two twins were adopted because his first two died. Emma lost her children. They didn't have a lot of, uh, you know, strength in his in his uh line, his line, his line of seed, whatever you want to call it. So there are so many reasons. I, I actually think this is such a weak argument. It's a very Mormon argument, right? Because we're like, we want the kids and we want the DNA and we want the Joseph Smith. Uh, if, you know, Grant Palmer's work is to be believed early on, he was not unfamiliar with sex. Uh, if his early journals about his own virtue were to be believed, he spent some time with uh, a women of ill repute he was not unfamiliar with uh, this, and neither were women. Yeah. Yeah. Again, we only use that question if only the sexual dynamic part of it matters. Like, you still have to own that Joseph Smith used predatory behavior and manipulation across the board with, on the record, most of these women. That if you were to make a... Uh, a study of what child predators do to manipulate children. For instance, one of the things they do is they give gifts. And in the paper I read, the gift they named was they give people watches, by the way. And then I go and read Mormon history where Joseph Smith had a pattern of giving these women watches, including the 16-year-old Flora Woodworth, who got a land deed. You have to deal with the manipulation and abusive tactics and the predatory behaviors and if you can explain those away, then maybe we can move on to whether there was sex, is, sex or not. But as Lindsay's pointing out, there are solutions for that problem too. Um, but it's not the crux of the issue. It's, it's how healthy and well acting was Joseph Smith towards these women. Right. Can I tell you a personal story that helped get my mind around this idea about contraception, which is this. When I was going through my first divorce back in 1994 or so, I talked to my mom and my mom had been married to my dad since forever. So actually since 1941. And my mom chose that moment where I was uh, going through a lot to let me know that actually my dad was not her first husband. And I was shocked. And she had been married briefly to another man prior to marrying my dad, and she had obviously divorced him. And then after taking this in, I said, uh, so are, do I have any brothers or sisters running around out there that I don't know about? And she said, no, well, I, we practiced contraception. And I said, contraception in the 1930s? And she laughed and said, well, it wasn't the dark ages. <laughs> that opened my eyes a little bit. Yeah. To yeah. think that women are stupid enough to not care for the consequences. If I'm in the 19th century and I'm a woman, I have to worry about sexual assault. I have to worry about pregnancy. And guess what happens if I'm assaulted or I get pregnant? I get blamed for it. I get shunned. I, I have to live in a life of uh, sacrifice, prostitution, who knows? So I'm going to be really careful about what happens to me. Now, we're all women. No, because there are a lot of set of circumstances. But to act like these women, uh, who some of who were already married, weren't smart and careful about this is naive and sexist, I think. I did mention a bill earlier today when we were talking about this very issue simply the possibility that if you have access to 30 or 33 women sexually, then you can arrange things such that the woman you're having sex with is not ovulating. Yeah. 
Yeah. So there's lots of explanations for that. And it doesn't come down to sex anyway. You still have to deal with an abusive Joseph Smith. And it Anything doesn't else explain you why Josephine Lyons thought Joseph Smith was yeah. the father of her child. Yeah. All right. I'm going to let you go, Mike. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you. Appreciate it. Have a great day. All right. Anything else from you guys? Okay. I well, will say something. Please. This is an overwhelming case. If the charge is Joseph Smith practiced polygamy, and this is the prosecution's case against him, I believe it has been proven way beyond a reasonable doubt at this point. And before anybody wants to talk to me about alternate evidence or alternate theories, I think that it is incumbent on them to address the issues and the facts and the evidence that we've put forward tonight. Yeah, what do they call this, RFM? It's a it's an open and closed case, right? You're being very, are you being funny now? Open and closed. Open and shut. Open and shut. There we are. Deniable plausibility. That's right. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you, guys. Appreciate thanks, your time, Lindsay, Lindsay thanks, Brian. Brian. You guys killed it. Love it. Have a great day, everyone. Therefore, any evidence I find, I will try and fit into that paradigm. I don't feel that I need to defend that paradigm. I feel that I want to understand 